Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John, and welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies, both new and old, with strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to make this a drinking game, people, <laughs> we, decided, right. we, de- we decided... <laughs> shit. To make this a drinking game, we decided to make this a drinking game. That's right. Shit, yeah. what's my line? I forgot my line. Guys, I don't this know. Is our, what is your line? This is our 199th episode, okay? Next week is our 200th episode. So the lines are getting blurred here. We're getting excited. We're yeah. getting giddy. The whiskey's flowing. We got beers here. And the reason we got our beers and whiskey is because we are a positive film podcast. That means we're tired of the stuffy critics harping on the negative. <laughs> It happens to us sometimes too, but if we do, we got a drink. That's the game. Anything negative at all. You're going to hear this sound. Mm. That sound means that we are taking a drink and we hope you drink along with us. So, pour yourselves a glass. We're going to wrap up the 2000s in our... uh... The first decade. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. Clink, clink, clink. The first decade of the 2000s, yes. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. Obligatory. Ah, That sound you heard was the obligatory shot at the beginning of the show. That's Just right. to get us lubed up. Lubed get us lubed up. up. I gotta say lubed Ooh. one more time. There we go. Positive film criticism lubed. podcast. So if you read the episode Ooh. notes, we are in week eight of our summer blockbuster face off, where we take the highest grossing summer blockbuster of every year and we battle them off head to head, bracket style until we determine the best summer blockbuster of all time. We started in 1980. We gave Jaws and Star Wars a little bit of a pass into the second round. And we are now entering into the 2010s. So we have a lot of backlogs. Please go back and listen to them. We give you a recap of the year. And then we talk about each film, the highest summer blockbuster of every year. And then we vote. One goes on. One stays in the dust with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Somehow, some people's favorite blockbuster of all time. (laughs) Ours was a round one upset. So much Upset, to talk about today. Indeed. So much to talk about. David, John, good to see you. John, you want to go ahead and shout our sponsors out? We, guys, we got two sponsors again. Yeah. Oh, he's back. We got he's him, Mr. Carlos. Reached, we, he reached out. He reached out. We haven't gotten the beers <laughs> so yet, fell, but he, he fellas, did reach out. I have beers. <laughs> did you Welcome reply back, to him? Mr. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I did. I replied. Okay, great. Oh, good, 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 good. We are talking about the one and only, that. the man, the myth, the legend, Carlos Barozzo, the brewmaster, our beer sponsor, C. Barozzo dot beer if you want to follow him on instagram and probably other socials give that man a like and a follow welcome back to the show carlos and the music on this episode and every single episode is provided by the artist dasein d-a-s-e-i-n download all or stream all of their music rather at all the usual music platforms enjoy yourself you're welcome dasein Mm. that sound all right that voice sounded like you were going to give us the side effects of what happens if you listen to (laughs) dasa yeah (laughs) speedy speedy voice wrapping it up all right you may experience transcendental flows of meditation before we (laughs) before we get into some notes at the end of the episode we'll tell you what we've been watching in our series what you've been watching john has a whole list of movies that he's been watching i saw a bunch of shit but you guys um, saw something that I did not get to see it this week. We'll talk about it in one second. Um, but the, to prep everybody for the movies that we are going to be talking about in a second, we are in 2008 to 2011. So the highest grossing summer blockbuster of 2008 is The Dark Knight, which will be up against 2009's highest grossing summer movie, which is Transformers Revenge Transformers of the Fallen. Revenge of the Fallen. <laughs> what? Dark Knight against Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Which is the better summer blockbuster? You have to keep listening to get the answer definitively once and for all. And then in the, in the back half of our episode, Toy Story 3, which was 2010's highest grossing summer blockbuster, will be up against 2011's edging out another Transformers movie. Barely. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 monster monster movie so toy story 3 against harry potter if you want to go ahead and skip to that one or you know you just want to move around our episode we take the episode notes very seriously and we have timestamps in there that dave curates for us dave does edit produce all of our episodes dark knight transformers easily toy story 3 harry potter dave any news you want to talk a little mission impossible uh i didn't get to see it this week Okay, so I it's had just the being... <laughs> worst schedule ever, and that's you know, sorry, sorry, Tom, but that's what happens when your movie's three fucking hours long, and I lead a busy life. Oh, Tom, you're not wrong. 
Um, it was fun that he seems to be he seems to be resigned yet supportive of the Barbie Oppenheimer job mm-hmm. next week. Yes. Everybody's saying the same thing, which is it's so exciting that everybody can spend the whole day at the theaters. And I love that they are basically advertising each other. I love the cross promotion of um, Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie, <laughs> like with their Oppenheimer tickets, and then Killian Murphy and Chris Nolan at Barbie. I think it's super fucking fun and cool. Well, they and it's on my mom's birthday, movies. so. <laughs> and they well, they went. To, actually, it was really fun because um, the premiere in L.A was the night that the right the sag strike was supposed to happen which as part of their guidelines you're not supposed to promote movies mm. so they're basically like they just got it in in time like in yeah. theory they should have left they, the after they, party they you scheduled know. it an hour early to is that uh, true yeah oh cool nice yeah. so they could make it and i heard one more thing wait i know i'm getting chatty here at the beginning but what just one thing about the strike everybody's talking about the strikes but i had a very good piece of advice because I think a lot of people are already starting to think like, well, if you're in support of SAG and you're in support of the writers and you want to go ahead and fuck over the CEOs of all these companies, the best thing to do is start canceling all of your subscriptions. First of all, that would be really bad for our movie podcast. So I don't think we're at the point where we can do that. <laughs> these movies that we saw today were on Disney Plus and HBO, the CEOs of which have been in the news a lot. And so I don't know what we would have done this week if we didn't have those two services. But a friend of mine actually said, because, and she's a writer, I think she's in WGA, because the CEOs of these companies do more than just oversee production of new content. So David Zaslav, right, is the CEO of Time Warner, is that or Warner Discovery? And then Whatever Bob Iger is, is the CEO of Disney, right? So yes, yeah, like maybe the Netflix CEOs would get fucked if we cancel Netflix, but what would theoretically happen is these C-suite executives who are still getting paid yeah. to not produce content, they are gonna go to their board and essentially say, look, we need to scale back streaming. And so they are going to release their budgets to SAG and say, great, we cut everything in half because of you. So it might actually make things more contentious. So don't cancel your subscriptions until the unions say so. You don't have to cancel Warner Brothers. They're canceling themselves. <laughs> but anyway, I thought that was interesting because a lot of people are like, let's cancel our shit. And actually, that's a really good point because this is, the problem with corporate consolidation is that they're doing more than just producing new TV shows. Mm. So if we cancel our shit, they're going to tell people, basically like how Disney is starting to sell off TV. They're going to, they might consider just selling off assets and, and allocating and also, smaller budgets, which is not helping anybody. So. If you can't go and see a movie, stream something at home because you've already paid the, the fee for it. And when they finally win and have to back pay those residuals, those numbers oh, that's count. Fun. That's fun. Anything you guys want to say about this, John? You got any insider scoop from being at this? Uh, I hear there's a school that you go to in Los Angeles that's pretty well known. Uh, are you get any insider info on any of this stuff? <laughs> Nothing, nothing too inside, honestly. I think every, everything everybody's reading, it was actually kind of strange leading up to it because it's not that they were being intentionally cryptic, but there weren't a lot of announcements like the night of. So eventually, SAG did put out on its website, because you haven't heard from us, that does mean that tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., what Pacific Coast time, we will meet with the, within our own board to officially strike. So it was kind of like they didn't really announce. So there were a lot of people who were just texting each other. And, yeah. Tweeting and doing all that sorts of shit well, like were, after midnight, being like, "What the fuck?" Like, I mean, they were they were under anything. they were under federal regulation right up until that point, right. as well. Which like was they, bullshit. They, they, bought in, they bought in federal mediators, yeah, yeah, it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. It was, so yes, yeah, no, no, no crazy inside info yet. But as you can imagine, since then, the scrambling word on the town is just it's just going to be really strange. Just having everything kind of brought to a halt. Um, the internship I'm at at uh, Mandalay Productions right now, just as an example, without breaking my NDA, you know, everyone who is trying to understand what can still be done to move mm-hmm. business forward while these new rules are in place for what people in SAG after and WGA can and cannot do. And um, so in some ways, there are still parts of this business that can move forward and can operate, but everything having to do with production cannot. So certain people who work in like post-production that I know specific, like just as for instance, they can continue moving forward with workflows because it has nothing to do with yeah. actors or writers. Hmm. Um, there are certain packaging yeah. ways to they'll, develop they'll projects. Have, they'll that have happen, no work but... in about seven months. Yeah. yeah. When all the stuff that's yeah. currently so, in post-production runs out and that all the yeah. other fucking stuff isn't finished. So and everybody Brent- is everybody. And I, w- without giving any other information away, I know of someone uh, who you guys know, and I'll share some more details a little bit later without giving anything else away, who was just an actor who's a good example, who was under a very specific situation where they were up for a part that was going to be a big deal for them. And now, you know, the brakes get hit. So hey, somebody I- from that perspective and a lot of perspectives 
who knows what's going to happen? Because yeah. like you said, the finances for all these companies are going to be shifting. What shows are going to move forward after this? How many slates are going to be cut in half? Yeah, exactly. You know, this is all just a big mystery. So the town, I feel like the town right now is kind of like anticipating a crazy change in the way things run. And I think everybody's scared to talk and admit mm. about uh, that we're probably going to be looking at a world with less content yeah. than before. Well, more and reality, more it's reality true. TV. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, that is what people like time, crazy. Yeah. yeah, people are talking about that shit for sure. Well, that's what they're doing. All the streamers are adding all this reality TV to cover. Well, thank for God, Sag and After joined so that theoretically yeah. a lot of these like hosts and other like big names that aren't necessarily on Sag, like hopefully it's covered now that it wouldn't have been twenty years ago. I, I mean, just, my, my favorite Disney... was my favorite was Bob Iger this morning. Uh, I think it was uh, saying how it's just ridiculous the stuff they want and they can't very well afford it. And he said that from a millionaire's retreat where they had to use their private jet to get to with like Zuckerberg and everyone. Yeah, fun. Dave, I love your shirt, by the way. It says, fix it. And then the words in post are crossed out and it says, on, on set. set. Yeah. Fix it yeah. on set, people. Let's it makes do it your post production crew. Good advice for later. Also, I had a friend, I had a student film a Disney pilot with a lot of kids. And not only did it not get picked up, they didn't even watch it because they were like, there's going to be a writer strike. And by the time we film episode two, you're all going to be a year older and it's going to be useless. So thanks. <laughs> How fun is that? Shit like that. Okay, yeah, cool. Exactly. All right. We're going to we take go. a non break to play some Dasein for you. And then we are going to get going with our first battle, The Dark Knight against Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Let's wait, wait, wait. Do it. Fuck. So you're not going to talk about Mission Impossible? You're I'm the only one who saw it. it. I'll wait till the end I, of the episode. Yeah, I didn't get to see it. I'll talk about Mission uh, Impossible at the end of the episode, people. We gotta wait till the end. Mission Impossible, let's go. All right, Dave, hit the segment timer. That means it's time to go. We got <laughs> Dark Knight, 2008's highest grossing film. We're gonna start talking about that first before we segue to Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, which is part two in the series, 2009, if you're keeping up. I think there's like, what, six or seven of those now, if you count Bumblebee. All right, let's um, yeah. talk about 2008. John, you got the numbers up there? Bumblebee was cool. Nice. I do, man. Uh, this what was- uh, What made some money? Another big year. We celebrated like one of our favorite movie years previously with um, in the, the last discussion of our previous episode. But this was also a really great year. Um, Dark Knight was clearly number one, but uh, a pretty gigantic kickoff here for a little a little franchise known as Marvel, uh, because coming in at number two, which also would have been a, considered a summer movie in, in our perspective on May 2nd, Iron Man. Holy shit. Mm. So the very beginning, John Favreau's Iron Man, RDJ, uh, man, they kicked it off. <laughs> just, just check this I, out, though, I already watched that recently. It still holds up. It does still hold up. I think yeah. so too. We're living in kind of a weird world though, because obviously Dark Knight is a superhero movie. I'm not I'm not saying it's not, but I think we all kind of talk about that movie like it's a little bit more highbrow, and we'll get into that, of course. But just to look at it from these numbers perspectives, domestically for the US that year, domestic, Dark Knight ended up bringing in about five hundred and thirty-one million dollars. That's a good that's a good steal. We talk about Marvel movies nowadays and we're expecting at least that. We're, we're, we're hoping for closer hmm. to the billion dollar mark. Iron Man was the first of that this giant franchise from this new period. Um, phase one, I guess is what they would call it. Number one of phase one. And it only did 318 Domestic. for that year. That's not so bad for almost, a debut character. It's uh-huh. not yeah. bad, but it's over 200 million less than The Dark Knight. So it's just funny, just yeah. to put yourself, it's still we're still talking about superhero movies, but just kind of bringing back your little time capsule a little bit and just imagining a world where a Marvel movie, even though it's the first one, did not fucking clean sweep it. Because folks, as you can imagine, we are going to be talking about a lot of Marvel movies moving forward. And the, just really quick to talk about the worldwide grosses, Dark Knight is number one, of course. It's right around a billion. I think it was under, and then they did a re-release. Iron Man was number eight internationally with $585 million worldwide because 54% of its box office gross was was in America. That just shows you that we like exported this comic book ex- ex- obsession into movies. Even The Dark Knight, 53% of the total worldwide gross was America. Nowadays, you, I mean, even the Transformer movies, it's like 300 million and then it's like 1.4 worldwide because you get all the other markets. That but I, I must admit, I was in Australia when Iron Man got dropped and I was like, what the fuck are they doing Iron Man for? I'd, I'd seen the cartoon yeah. with the like the really catchy theme and that, that was it. And I'm like, I've never even heard of this character because I you know, never threw in with Marvel. I was like, I couldn't believe they did it. And it, it turned out to be awesome. Anyway, yeah. carrying on yeah. about the Dark Knight. Very successful, very successful. <laughs> um, Kingdom, Indiana Jones, the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. 
yeah number two came out so we just talked folks we you know anyone who saw that last couple weeks like that's how long ago that was everyone keeps all the diehard indiana jones more recent all the diehard indiana jones what are you talking about indiana jones always come out at the same time yeah (laughs) unreal so that's number one two and three batman (laughs) iron man and indiana jones uh then we have some fun movies also in that superhero world hancock i think jeff and i have praised that before on this episode on this show yeah that was uh, was a big swing that thing yeah. big swing yeah and it was also one of the first times i think i had seen bateman in a movie mm. of oh, that yeah. size in a while he plays charlie theron's has husband and he's great dry you know yeah. delivering the charm hilarious that was the start uh, of his comeback wally, really, wasn't it? wally yeah it, well he was i think arrested development was already oh, happening yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he was starting to move and uh when was dodgeball 2004 or five when did we talk about that oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, Patton. You know, of course, that shit. Um, you're not hey, wrong, uh, so Patton. Have, um, you're not wrong. Uh, Wally, Kung Fu Panda, uh, Madagascar 2, Twilight, the first one. There you go. Another debut this year. Really <laughs> big deal. Still top 10. Number nine, domestically, is still going through one through nine, one through 10. Number nine, Quantum of Solace, the second uh, James Bond with Daniel Craig. And then number 10, Horton Hears a Who. Interesting. Jeff, give us the rest of the context. For, for um, that idea. <laughs> um, also, note yeah, that some of, these got affected, who. <laughs> some of these got affected by the last writer strike. So, for instance, Quantum of Solace was actually filming during mm-hmm. the last writer strike, although that was because of the, how long it takes. Most of these movies didn't. Very famously, Mamma Mia came out at the same time as uh, The Dark Knight. They came out the same weekend in America. And Mamma Mia would go on to be the <laughs> highest grossing film in the UK ever. <laughs> ever it made almost 600 million dollars worldwide even though it wasn't even in our top 10 because the brits fucking love that shit yeah dude Abba, Abba is a smash hit over there yeah, yeah. good for them dude yeah. That's great. yeah hell yeah go um euro euro uh whatever that euro contest is um but anyway uh the dark knight 400 million dollar gross in 18 days 400 million domestic in 18 days shrek Holy 2 did shit. it in Shrek 2 wow. did it in 43 days. So it doubled the record, essentially, in wow. in speed and time. Now, of course, all these records would get broken by Avatar next year, but it's still fun to dream. Um, yada, 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 yada. Oscars, this is the year of Slumdog Millionaire. So Slumdog Millionaire won eight Oscars, including director and picture, two for writing the scores, the writing, mm. sorry, one for writing, two for score and sound. So there's five out of their eight right there. Um, Sean Penn wins his second Oscar, beating Mickey Rourke for The Wrestler. Marissa Tomei was also nominated for The Wrestler. Um, Kate Winslet wins Best Actress over herself, essentially, for Revolutionary Road. Wait, 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 hold on, wait, wait, pause. You said Sean Penn won? He beat Mickey Rourke for The Wrestler, yeah. Yeah, so what did he win for? It sounded like... The oh, sorry, he, he won, won for, for milk. milk. He won for milk, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Kate Winslet wins for The Reader, and this is really interesting because for the Golden Globes, and I think also for the SAGs, she put The Reader in supporting category because revolutionary road was her submission for the leading category but the academy Mm. stepped in and said no 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 no. you're also a lead in the reader even though the boy is the lead you're also a lead and so she said fuck and so she decided to put the reader in the lead category and i feel like she just sort of won as a composite you know what i mean like this category exactly yeah get it fired back up we haven't heard that in a while but um yeah she wins which was which was really really interesting yada 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 um other performances i'll shout out in a second and then heath ledger won every single imaginable award for the dark knight um his family accepted the oscar and it was very touching. Penelope Cruz won for Vicky Cristina Barcelona. That's a Woody, Woody Allen script. Of course, Dustin Lance Black wins for Milk, yada, yada, yada. Wally, of course, is best uh, animated film. And I really love Man on Wire, the documentary, which won. Um, I think other standouts mm. here. I'm gonna, I am going to keep these tight this week, Dave, I promise. In fucking Bruges, people. In Bruges came out yes, this dude. year. Yeah, Fuck yeah, we've done uh, Rafe. Fucking Brendan Gleeson, Farrell. Doubt was this year. So you got Meryl Streep, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, and Viola Davis giving in some star studded turns. You got Benjamin Button, Frost Nixon, and then Tropic Thunder uh, gets Robert Downey Jr. an Oscar Tropic nomination. Thunder. Yes, dude. <laughs> in a comedy. How hilarious is that? Other ones, I, I'm gonna try, I'm just gonna, I don't even wanna say all these. Charlie Bartlett, I'll shout out because Anton Yelkin became a little bit of a star because of that. Cloverfield and Jumper, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, The Strangers is really fucked up. If you guys know that movie, The Happening, yeah. of course, came out this year. Step Brothers and Get Smart got some comedies. Frozen River won a bunch of awards too, and then you get was, weird. You get weird movies like The Rocker and The House Bunny gives us, you know, Anna Faris, Emma Stone, Kat Dennings. You know, Burn After Reading. I think The Duchess is great if you love your Ray Fiennes and Kiara Knightley kind of shit. Um, Eagle Eye with Shia. There's a weird little. There's a weird little Kevin Bacon-y kind of game. Not with Kevin Bacon, but everybody knows the game. Cloverfield was directed by Matt Reeves. 
and that was his first big feature film. And he is now helming the Batman franchise. Yeah. And we were talking about The Dark Knight. So pretty fun. All these things are connected. I want to shout out two movies. One yeah. we've talked about for sure before. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Tropic Thunder. Uh, Jumper came out this year. Mm hmm. And uh, I thought that was a cool one. I'm glad you shouted out Tropic Thunder. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to shout out Charlie Wilson's War. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was a, a fun. Super Hoffman, man. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a fun movie. He just shatters the, that glass with a hammer. It's so fucking funny. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. All right, Juno. Let's get... oh, sorry. Juno came out Wait, this that's... year. No. Didn't it? Or did that? It was No, it came out two th uh, 2007, December 5th. It's my bad. No worries. Step brothers. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm All sorry. Right. The Dark Knight. We don't need to set this up. What do you guys think? You guys rewatch yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, I, Pineapple Express. Do we mention that? Sorry. Let's did not, I did. I watch the Dark Knight. Nah, I've seen it enough. I didn't. Of course, I fucking rewatched it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Good for you, dude. Good for you. Dude, I did dude, this. John? This had everything going for it. Sorry, keep going, Dave. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, it like in its lead up, like we're saying how much how much money it made, and it like it had everything going for it. You had the success of Batman Begins, which was awesome, and then you start throwing the magical J word around, like you throw the Joker around, you automatically double your audience because everybody loves the Joker, and then you've got like say. it's like can can he do it as good as Jack, and then people started seeing clips and they're like oh shit this is a different take on the Joker that we've ever seen before and word spread. And then, yeah, it was, uh, this was an event film. He, yeah. he, it's, it's really fucked up to say, but Heath dying at the early, I think it was the beginning of the year or the end of the last year. Mm. I mean, you know, it had this allure to it. That's like, it's in a really fucked up way. It, it increased that sort of need to see it right away. Like and then the, the, that sure. myth, the myth sprung up that he just couldn't get the character out of his system and yeah. stuff. Then it just fed it's, itself. Even though he was already yeah. filming another movie. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah, weird. Was, uh, yeah. Maybe instead of the, he's filming imaginary like, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think instead of, um, I mean, we can talk about the rewatches too. We've all seen this so many times and maybe we all watched it this week as well. But I do think that the, the initial watch was so strange, not only because of what you guys were saying, like, I think Batman, the second movie in a really, really successful Batman franchise, you know, with this new world flavor that Chris Nolan was bringing to it. We mentioned a couple episodes of the, or, or last episode about um, Batman Begins and how mm. it didn't gross number one, but it was critically acclaimed. Everybody knew it was good. So this was highly anticipated regardless. Heath's performance changed things. Uh, I mean, uh, passing change things as well with their marketing and just the word of mouth. But I, I still don't even know if that actually, none of that stuff for me anyway, set me up to, to actually be ready for the quality of a film that Chris Nolan was going to make. And I think more than anything else, it was that the structure of the movie is so strange. And we kind of talked about how on the franchise face off, how like Batman Begins is a tighter film. Yeah. And that this one, some people think it's a little bit too long. And if some people think the end coda situation with Two-Face actually kind of ends up deconstructing a little bit of the stuff that they achieved with the Joker. I feel like Two-Face was a waste. Killing, and, and, like killing. And, but, but, Spoilers, but the guys. question you have to ask is that like, would that, would this movie be that movie if it had been 40 minutes shorter and just a really tight version with the Joker? And Probably not, right? Like, you, I feel like you needed that other element in there to kind of make this the Godfather 2 of superhero movies. Yeah. Where, like, it was so long and so much was happening that Batman couldn't actually ground himself by concentrating on one foe. It was like he was, he was starting, like... Oh, no, I'm know, not saying he wasn't this... needed. It was, a, it was a waste having him in the film. It's a, it was a waste killing him. That, that villain could have carried on and could have carried on beautifully. Yeah, they yeah, really, yeah. good they call. Really, they really did, a, like, a good job on him. Have you seen the uh, the interview with Aaron Eckhart talking about the this, this hospital scene with uh, Heath? He came no. basically. Heath came in already in character as he did on that on that film, and he just walked around the hospital bed like grunting for like twenty minutes. And hmm. then at one point, like Aaron raised his hand, he grabbed it, and they just went for it. And like, but it was twenty minutes of grunting and prep from. Uh, from Heath to do it. And he sat that's there cool. and they, they went through the process together. And that's the that's scene cool. we got out of that is what we saw. 
because Gary Oldman and others did say that like he did talk to them like on set like it's not yeah that was probably just sort of like uh you know you don't have rehearsal so that in a way was like we do do that kind of stuff in rehearsal if you're an actor yeah and you usually say by the way I'm going to do this shit but like on a film set you don't get that so like it's not like he did that all the time but I'm sure for that particular scene he was like this let's have some fun I want to shock him a little bit clips of him riding a skateboard jumping over Batman so (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. I think there's a big go ahead John so no 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 you're ready I think. I think two things can be true. I think this is the best summer blockbuster of the 21st century. And in fact, this probably should be, if not a semi-finalist, it's probably going to be a quarter finalist for us. I think this is going to go very far. I know. love it. That's bold. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. hundred percent. I also think there's a couple things in this movie that really frustrate me every single time I see it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you rewatch it this week? Yeah. And nice. so the first time I, re- the first time I watched it, I was really mad about Rachel, the character of Rachel. And I think I put a lot of the blame on Maggie Gyllenhaal. And the more I've watched it, I blame her less and I blame Christopher Nolan more. I feel like tonally, Rachel, especially her relationship with Harvey, but also the way she interacts with Bruce and this love triangle is about the same tonally as like an episode of Felicity or uh, Gilmore Girls. That's that it means nothing to me. And the first one, I'm not saying I'm not saying Katie Holmes is Meryl Streep, but the way that was framed was this impassioned love story that they're so close they can't be in love. And there's two, you know, there's like how what a powder keg that was. This was a little more lackadaisical. Even that scene at the restaurant, it was just too, it didn't, I didn't have the tension. Like, I don't know, I didn't feel that. The two-faced thing you guys already talked about. So I think um the big thing for me in this rewatch is the turn to Dark Knight. And I think we're on the same page because they decided that the turn to Dark Knight was that he was going to take the blame for all the stuff Two-Face did and even killing Harvey Dent. And that made him the Dark Knight, this legend of the person who was actually bad the whole time and he, whatever. But the, the Two-Face thing was like a C plot. And even the Joker yeah. says, like, all it was was, like, honestly, the A plot at the end in the warehouse with the boats and they decide not to kill each other. And Batman is like, see, people are better. They're, everybody doesn't want anarchy. That's the A plot. And then the Joker says, yes, but I turned Harvey Dent, so I win. Ah, uh, not good enough for me. And so then when he sits there and be like, well, I'm Harvey Dent. I, I'm going to take credit for all of his shit. That doesn't do it for me either as the Dark Knight. Whereas, and I'm not telling Christopher Nolan how to do this movie, but the Batman saw the twist, which is that all of the clowns holding the doctors as hostages were the hostages and all of the doctors were the villains. So the SWAT team was gonna come in and kill them. So what does Batman have to do? He has to beat the shit out of a lot of SWAT teams. So we have the opportunity right there in real time in the A plot to watch Batman beat the shit out of cops and SWAT teams and look like the villain. But instead they gave him a pass on that and they made him the villain for something that doesn't matter off camera. That bothered me so much this time I rewatched it. It bothered me so Mm. much. And yes, I agree. They should have kept Two-Face alive. And Mm. then we had Batman and Two-Face are both sort of villains in the world's eyes. I think that could have been really fun setting up the third movie, which is the weakest out of three. So that's what I think. Do you think that, because this, I'm, I'm gonna get a little heady here, but just to play devil's advocate to that, I have always wondered if, Each of these movies, each of these three movies, I feel like represents a kind of a different perspective on uh, Bruce Wayne and or Batman, Gotham and the villains. For me, Begins is origin for Batman. For the second one, Dark Knight is about Gotham for me. It's about politics. It's about the Joker trying to play on the fears of the people. I'm I'm thinking much more about the city and uh, the way that they cover and shoot Mm -hmm. Chicago as, as Gotham. Uh, I love it. In I the love games Chicago's he ends Gotham. up playing, yeah. the A plot builds to the people versus the people, which is, you know, I think we all love that brilliant yeah. device at the end with the ships versus the ship. Uh, and then for C, it's about villains, like uh, for the rising. I feel like it's all about like sculpting the ideas of antagonism against good, against good, evil versus good. Um, so from that light, there's always been a part of me that's wondered if, if just a little bit more scene work, to push that theme forward that I think what they wanted us to feel, and I'm not disagreeing with you at all, because I, I think a lot of people empathize with what you're talking about, but Harvey Dent, from a news coverage perspective, if we were just people, citizens of Gotham, we don't have footage of him beating the crap out of the SWAT people. Right, Harvey yeah. Dent is our megaphone. So I, I do understand that the Joker mm. being able to say very cleanly, 
I just turned your white knight. Yeah. And that's all people are going to give a shit about. Everybody was so scared of everything. And I made them realize that I can just tear it all to pieces yeah. by changing well, him. Not, that only, he is not a, only did I turn yeah. you white knight, I made it look like you killed him. Yeah, which is, again, in, imagining just like in a 24-hour news cycle, but also weeks of falling away headlines. Yeah. The, there might be footage of the, you know, this could have easily been fixed by just showing a little bit of cell phone footage of him kicking the shit out of these SWAT people. But so, uh, Jeff, I hear you, but I wonder from the Gotham okay. perspective, with that with that cap on, if it if it does work, because that's actually how Harvey Dent saw his job. You know, it's all, we very scarcely saw him talking to the press mm. and stuff. I feel like it was, but it, but the way that he fit into the Gotham zeitgeist. You know, he was bigger. But I, I hear what you're saying, and I definitely, definitely, definitely agree with you. The only, un- really, for me, un- bigger than this issue, unfortunate thing about all these movies is that Rachel is a clearly a big role in Bruce Wayne slash Batman's life in number one and number two, and she is written as a device female love interest. And and that's a shame, just yeah, because yeah. I, I think and that the damsel in she did... Yeah, Even yeah, which is... Direct, but still. And I, and I totally agree with what you're saying that like Rachel in one kind of turns him to Batman. Like mm-hmm. she had a, a full theme arc by eventually revealing it's not who I am, but what I do that matters. Like she was the one who planted that seed. Like that's mm-hmm. such a wonderful payoff as amazing as the detonation choose between Harvey Dent and choose between her sequences. And it's perfect. It's fucking it's, yeah. perfect. Yeah. And number two, again, she's kind of a device in that sequence. Like we already know that she matters to him, not because of what was shown to us in this movie. And that, that, that is the only thing that's unfortunate. Don't want to hold it against them too much. Cause they had the casting change and yeah, it's tough. I mean, there was I, probably yeah, some stuff but, cut out of this for time as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. The movie's good. Cause I could have used yeah. some more. I, I like her. And how do you feel about, how do you feel about her character? Not as a device, but her character is like literally developing character of, of Rachel. Um, do you feel like her character has developed more in the charity scene where the Joker comes in and yeah, let me yeah. tell you about my father? I would say so, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I, I could have used a couple more moments like that where she exists in the antagonist world and Harvey Dent's world with character development. Mm-hmm. And then we could have gone there. So, And you're right, Dave. Maybe there is something on the floor and we just don't get to see it. It's already a very long movie. Yeah. But, um, but I love that, Jeff, even though you're saying that like I have these issues and I think a lot of people are going to agree with you. You still think that it? Yeah, I mean those first might two, be your favorite. Those first 2000s. two thirds, especially, are like as gripping, intense. Every single set piece, every single action-packed moment is fully justified, fully fleshed out, matters. It's important and it's confusing and debaucherous and and clean at the same time. It's brilliant. It's it's absolutely brilliant. I agree, and I, I I'm gonna be honest, guys. I did not get to. I had a weird schedule this week. I did not rewatch this one, but uh, I saw it last year at one point. I watched it by kind of out of context by myself again unbelievable also, quick, the opening quick scene shout with out, the joker yeah quick shout out to the soundtrack especially in that scene mm. as well where they yeah. use buzzes so and serious, noises dude. and stuff yeah that that why so serious intro i watched it in class actually in a screenwriting structure class about exposition is fucking annoying and hard and everybody hates it audiences don't like watching it we don't like writing it it's, you know everybody's on the same page about how difficult it is and how successful the act of watching the heist take place and revealing information from heistmen to heistmen about the boss who set yeah. up this sequence. Why do they call him the and Joker? In, yeah. Yeah. And just, and it seems a little campy and cheesy, but as, as successful as those things are, that's not really that uh, difficult to understand. They're literally just telling you things about this guy who we already know the movie's about. But then the reveal, watching him. We know it's Joker at that point. I think most people know that's hmm. that's him, who's still in the mask. The way he's moving and dodging, the character development that happens when that Julia Roberts brother, what's that guy's name, who brings out the shotgun and starts shooting at him in the bank. Watching the Joker respond to him, and then the why, you know, uh, makes you stranger. I just feel like the, the development that happens at the very beginning sets you up so well so that somehow, just, just kind of the opposite of what we just said about, about Rachel's character, there's character development within Joker in within the exposition. 
that is interesting. It's not just a villain doing something bad. That's what usually happens. Also, Somebody yeah. robs something and now we just know they're a villain. We learned about the kind of Joker that he was going to be yeah. in that exposition. They, they set the and rules for how unique. fucked up this was going to get. Yeah. Yeah. So say, good. Did you right, say so William, so. William Fitchner is Julia Roberts's brother? I think he is, dude. I don't I don't see that in here, but I mean, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Some relation. I don't see that in here, but anyway, it's cool. All right. Pretty fun. I lied to you. It's not, it's not. I'm sorry. William Fitchner. Okay, cool. Dark Knight. We have no time for uh, Transformers, so we should just vote. Moving on. Um, Transformers, <laughs> Revenge of the Fallen, the highest grossing summer movie of 2009, which of course... It's the year of Avatar, but Avatar did not come out in the summer. So this is our game, people. This is what we're up to. Domestic numbers on the charts. John, what other movies made some money in 2009? I'll just keep doing my, my top 10 situation here. Um, so, yeah, you said Avatar. That was clearly a number. T- t- <laughs> this, is, this is so nuts. Even for the fact that it came out, we've had this situation happen before. It came out December 18th, folks. So it only had like 13 days. <laughs> maybe 14 with the Thursday night midnight release before the end of the year. And it still is number two. It still is number two for the year with the numbers uh, before it went on to just absolutely dwarf everything in in sight. So that is number two. Uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, the sixth book, sixth movie uh, is number three. Up number four. Got to love that one. That'll, Mm -hmm. that'll break your heart right in half. Um, The second Number five, the second Twilight uh, installment, uh, New Moon. Number six, The Hangover. Hey, uh, look out. That's the first one of those. That's a fun little debut there. Um, Number seven, Dave and I are going to love this one. Star Trek, baby. J.J. Abrams' first (laughs) debut with the Star Trek franchise. I fucking love that first movie. God, it's absolutely so much fun. It's so good, dude. It's so good. Really quick, Uh, Star Trek has a 66% domestic share which means that 66% of its money came from America. We are way more obsessed with Star Trek than the rest of the world. <laughs> Go ahead. I kind of like that. It's good, yeah. good, 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 good. Like, is that an except American me. made? Uh, <laughs> is that uh, Dave? Yeah, except for Dave. <laughs> uh, number eight, this is kind of weird, but the blind side is somehow what? <laughs> number eight for domestic numbers on according to the numbers, which that's really weird. That's it came out really November weird. 20. Uh, number nine, Monsters versus Aliens. Interesting. And number 10, I think at the third installment of Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. Weird. Mm. Jeff, hit us. Um, so this is the Oscars year. Were there any other big movies that uh, made a lot of money elsewhere? I mean, you said up, right? Yeah, 2012 disaster movies up yeah. there really high. Uh, okay, cool. So the Oscars this year, it's Hurt Locker versus Avatar. And I think everybody knew, like, because because James Cameron had won for Titanic and Avatar is going to get a lot of the visual effects, not a lot of the effects awards, you know, sound and all that kind of stuff. So the Hurt Locker would win Best Director, Best Picture. I would say best uh, straight up, I didn't know because I, we were having Oscar parties at that point and we introduced blue tequila rounds for if you went for Avatar and it lost. So we, were, we had to drink it and I put through Do down for, that night i threw not the end of it no uh the only thing i remember <laughs> is just doing a blue shot after avatar didn't win best picture i had already done about four or five blue shots before that so yeah no that was that was a rough that was a rough morning it was a rough one for you um nice the, the performance ones are interesting so you have jeff bridges wins for crazy heart uh maggie gyllenhaal was also nominated mm. for that so she uh you know scott cooper things going right. yeah uh sandra bullock wins for the blind side yeah she famously won a razzie that weekend too but fuck the razzies so she wins for the blind side very very strange year again for the those two categories but deserving wins of course uh, christoph waltz does a clean sweep for inglorious bastards and nobody complained about whether or not he was a leader supporting um but yes he won for best supporting and monique won Best Supporting Actress for Precious, despite not Precious. campaigning. And she very famously said, thank you for focusing on the performance and not the campaign because she refused to campaign yeah. for Precious. And Gabourey Sidibe, of course, was also nominated in the lead category for Precious, which would also win Best Script, um, beating Up in the Air. So Precious won Best Script over Jason Reitman and his partner for Up in the Air. And then, of course, Up won Best Animated Movie and M- Michael Giacchino won Best Score for that fucking probably just for those two montages holy shit <laughs> jesus christ other performances to shout out and education with carrie mulligan who is nominated and peter sarsgaard it's a big breakout year for both of those colin firth in a single man holy shit that movie's good and he's good in that mm. meryl streep and julian julia call. oh the phone call oh my god 
Up in the Air, George Clooney, Anna Kendrick, and Vera Farmiga were all nominated for Up in the Air. Mm. Nine, the movie, did not do well. Uh, but Penelope Cruz was nominated a year <laughs> after winning. And Stanley Tucci was nominated not for Julie and Julia, but for The Lovely Bones, where he played the villain. And very famously, Ryan Gosling was oh, fired for gaining weight because Peter Jackson, who is not the most attractive man in the world, decided he wanted that mm. lead character, who in the book is overweight, to be fuckable. So he recast him with Mark Wahlberg on a week's notice. We talked wow. about we talked about Invictus. <laughs> if you go through our feed, people, Invictus. So Matt Damon and Morgan Freeman were both nominated. And District 9 comes out this year, and they ah. they extended Best Picture to be up to 10. As long as you got 5% of the vote, you can get nominated. So District 9, even though it had like kind of mixed reviews, which is bullshit because District 9 is fucking awesome, and we also talked about it. Um, District We talked about Invictus and District 9 both in our 2009 yeah. episode, and Avatar. Those were the three episodes. Yeah. I think we did Avatar, and was it really that bad? <laughs> yes, we did. And we rewatched it at home, and it, it, it held up. Okay, really quick. John loves Bronson, so we got to shout that out. Lars von Trier's Antichrist, oh, yeah. notorious Paul Bart Mall Cop. Let's go. Taken comes out this year. Incendiary comes out this year. <laughs> Coraline, Friday the Thirteenth, Watchmen, I Love You Man, Adventureland, and Zombieland, the two lands. Fighting, Drag Me to Hell, uh, The Hangover. You said Land of the Lost is really dumb, but also has some funny moments. Moon, Sam Rockwell comes out this year. Um, Ooh, that was, that was a fun one. That was good. 500 Days yeah. of Summer. If you love your little indie rom coms, 500 Days of Summer. Fun. In the Loop, I watched yeah. recently. Yeah. If you're a Succession fan and a Veep fan, you got to watch In the Loop. Funny People, Mr. Nobody, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Splice, Jennifer's Body, Brothers, Princess and the Frog. Let's move on. Okay, we have 37 seconds left to talk. No. <laughs> no 30 seconds. Um, Guys, I'm going to make a serious confession to you. Mm-hmm. And I hope we can all just, just laugh along. You didn't see this movie, you've never seen it before. I watched the first transformers by accident and i don't even know if i've seen this transformers movie <laughs> so which one are you gonna vote for um it's gotta it's gotta be this over dark Knight, I mean, right you've, you've this seen, is clearly you've seen the at least two-thirds of it so yeah if you've watched the first one <laughs> okay yeah so um, i really want to hear you guys talk about it and then i'm going to chime in and say what well, you're talking about the first one right and then you're going to say no no we're talking about the second one. wait okay so cool. you the movie where they go to egypt you don't remember this I think I did see it, but but it's been probably since theaters, so I I, I don't have much memory of it. It didn't stick. How Sorry, was the first Michael. Transformers movie in your rewatch? Um, what do you guys think of the second Transformers movie? Dave, what do you think? Well, I, I want to say like we we are. Uh, I'm glad that wasn't for me. We are talking about summer blockbusters. This this has. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everything mm-hmm. that you yeah, want got a summer blockbuster. It's got, it's got yeah. aliens. It's got action. It's got global threats. It's got female characters being completely stripped of their agency. Yep. It's got everything oh, that you want Jesus. in a blockbuster film. <laughs> I'm giving that to you. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's got it's got the most fuckable college freshmen that have ever been captured. Oh yeah, on sexually film. ambiguous oh. Australians in college like that Jeffrey. as well. So. Uh, <laughs> that reveal of her on the bike like wiping down i'm just watching the trailer now in the background right now you guys where she's like at the mechanics and she is for no reason at all bent over the bike in a mini skirt waxing it or working That's on how it she or opens like, this movie they, they literally they, they literally decided like her she's like short. Her, she goes, so the first movie she's in a car <laughs> right she's Christ. like she's like in the trunk of a car so in the second movie they do the exact same scene but on a motorcycle it's yeah so... awful dude um awful. No, well, you know what? I rewatched this the other night, and we sat there and watched it. Yeah. And it's apart from a couple of annoying characters, it it is a blockbuster movie. I mean, yeah. if you yeah. want to argue best blockbuster, this could potentially knock Dark Knight out because Dark Knight is far more cerebral. And it, no, I can't fucking keep a straight face. Dave, face. I see Dave, yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Dave does the shit what? all the time. Noah's going to win our blockbuster. Go on. to the, go go to the end of the plank on that. I want to I hear mean, you. Dark Knight <laughs> is a far more cerebral kind of plot-driven film, which is not what a lot of summer blockbusters are looking for. This is this is explosions and action beats every, like, you know, 30 oh God, minutes or whatever. <laughs> 30 um, minutes? <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes they settle down and do every the parental 90 thing. Every seconds. Um, oh, yeah. Comedy. How many 360, this, this, this how many 360 dollies? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like seven in the first 20 minutes. But uh, <laughs> nice, nice. no, this, this does, it tells a good story. It has throwbacks to previous characters. This is a good summer blockbuster film. And this is the last, I'm asking, is this the, excuse me, the last Shia LaBeouf before Mark Wahlberg kind of comes no, in? No, but they pretend to, to kill him in this movie. 
No. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, this, I think he does have. He is in the third one. Yeah, he's in the saying? third one. Yeah. After that, okay. they kind of okay. move away. He actually made enough okay. money in that third one that that's why he can never have to worry about these ever again. Yeah. <laughs> um, did Hoobastank do the score on this movie? Hoobastank. <laughs> Remember Hoobastank? Michael Bay clearly loves that kind of. Movie. There were so many good. There's a, there's a scene in this Not where they wrap but... these four like cheesy chords over and over and over again, and then a band that sounds like Hoopastank just sings "Don't Let Me Go" over and over and over again. They just like "Don't Let Me Go," "Don't Let Me Go," do and it just keep, and I was like, "This is the cheesiest fucking shit I've ever seen in my life." But <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying about Michael Bay loving Hoopastank? There's just, I mean, there's there the was a lot of people, that get kind out. of yeah, the reason yeah, there was a lot of that kind of music in the first one as well, so. Uh, we I know will, his uh, I will music say, video background, but a couple of standout points. I like the ILM knocked the shit out of this with the uh, uh, the effects the were awesome. The, the effects were really effects. good. Like one of the um, Decepticons near the beginning when they're chasing it transforms front face onto the camera. It just like starts to become something else, and for a second the mechanism forms the Decepticon face, and it was wow. I was like, fucking hell, that is like some, that's like someone's thrown that in. And they've gone, fuck yeah, that's cool. Let's keep that. Like, the I'm way, sure that wasn't directed. The way the, the sexy vixen, um, who again, not a college freshman. Um, I actually was going to ask you guys, but John didn't see the movie. I was like, if you were really single, would you, would you get one of those? Would you get one of those robots or, uh, or what? <laughs> the sexy vixen robot. Um, but when she transforms and like the skin comes off yeah, and she turns into, Oh my God. I mean, the, the effects are really good. The way that they do like the boat sinking, you know, when the attack at sea happens and they, they basically do the Titanic where the, the bow of the ship goes up in the mm. air and the people start falling down. I was like, I think the, the most impressive thing about the effects, and I don't know anything about effects, is that they're not still, not that any effects is, but the, the camera's always moving. So the, yeah. these effects are happening in what feels like 4D, you know, because the camera's moving around. And so like the, the gra you know, gravity and the size as they're going and, and speeding up and accelerating and then mm. the color and the lighting that comes with it, like as the camera's in motion. Yeah. And I mean, it's shots, really shots brilliant. A camera will pan through a transformer while it's transforming and shit. Like, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. And I've seen all the backpacks. So I know the kids love this shit. You yep. know, and I know they need, they don't need much. <laughs> they need a simple story. But even like, you know, whenever I actually think Shia is perfect for these movies. I think yeah. he's so great. Yeah. It's there's right a line in his delivery. Range. There's a lot. <laughs> I think he's got an acting he's range. He's good. He's but, good in these. Yeah, I think he's perfect. No, for these I was being serious. Like there's he does yeah. he does this justice. When, when the girl attacks really him and he does these the high, when he does these high pitched screams. I don't know if he did this in the first, but when okay, the girl was attacking funny. him and he's. Ah! It, yeah. Honestly, it sounds like those goat bleat videos from like, you know, a couple years ago. Like, and I was like, is that Shia? He was doing a it for five minutes. Ago. And I was like, where is that laugh? And I was like, oh my God, is that coming from Shia? Yeah. He has this one line reading where he's at the fraternity and Bumblebee shows up and it's in the front yard. And so he's at this frat party with all of the, you know, techies that also are like break dancers, you know? And, um, and all of a sudden they're like, dude, is that your Camaro parked on my lawn? And he's like, no, it's, it's for a friend of mine. <laughs> Who uh, uh, he just had to leave for a second to get you tighter shirts, and the way he says it, it's like, I, I don't know how he. It, it's even Stevens like grown up. I mean, it's so yeah. funny. And then the guys are like, "What? That's not possible!" And yeah. like, oh my god, his reaction. Th these dumb little things really get you through a movie like this because you're at a frat party. He's just trying to have fun, and then Bumblebee comes, and then the vixen attacks him, and then he's with Megan Fox, and then they get attacked. And there's so many fucking attacks in this movie. This movie is exhausting. There's so many things, yeah. but because it's done so well, and because the lead is so funny and charming, it's really, it's not, it's not as, it's not that, it's not that bad. It's, it's, there's a lot of entertaining shit. There's a lot of really good, meaningful moments. It is, I love yeah, the it's moment. It's some of Blockbuster material. I think you're right, man. I love the moment. Guys, talk to me about, but there's one moment really quick that I yeah, think is really important because I, I was sitting there and I was like, okay, this is just going to be the same and it's going to be machines against machines on Earth and they're going to kill a lot of Americans. And basically the, the US military says, can you leave the planet because it looks like the fight is between you. And they're like, we'll do that if that's what you wish. But you just have to ask yourself, what if you're wrong and we leave? And it was like me. It was like, I was like, okay, cool. We got a movie. We yeah, got a movie. Cool I feel idea. like they really no, pulled these kinds good. of things. I remember yeah. that. That's it's cool. good. Yeah. Thematically. Let mm -hmm. me ask you a question in terms of how much attention was given to the machines versus the humans because in the first one i was actually because i had not seen the first one since it came out either which was in 2007 yeah. so i fucked up and watched the wrong one uh but i remember <laughs> the other night i was like huh they're actually there's way less time spent on the transformers in the very first movie than the humans 
Hmm. It is mostly about Shia LaBeouf and the government getting involved, John Turturro, yeah. Yeah. Um, all those guys. And and I was I was kind of surprised at how little uh, coverage there was and how little, how few scenes were about the, not just in general, them fighting and stuff. There was some footage of that, but how little of their perspective there was. Was there more of the machine Transformers perspective in this one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like storytelling yeah, they, wise and, and filming wise? Too. They, they evened it out. Yeah. You still get the beats where you've got like his going to college story advancing with the parents now coming in as comic relief because the parents are in on it, but they can't say anything. Um, and so you get all that, but you also get the storyline of like the history of the Transformers going right back to the Fallen, um, which is mm. some of Prime's relatives. Um, so you get all that back mythology as well. So there's a lot packed in here, and, and it is Decepticons longer for it. Too. Like, but yeah, you get a I'm, lot of villains. Some of his relatives, too. guys. How do they BC? reproduce? Huh? What do you think? 17, Very 70, noisily. Oh. How do they fuck? Is really, I guess, what I'm. A lot of W. A lot of WD forty. Um, <laughs> okay, have you is. ever heard someone making a horseshoe? <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> oh, that's good. You know what else happened to this movie oh, that I think fun. they put a lot of pressure on Shia, but they they turn him into John Nash from A Beautiful Mind. Um, oh yeah, with a little bit of Rain Man in there, so he has to like freak out and write these alien symbols, and I mean. That's one of those things that as an actor, I bet you Shia like never felt comfortable with that where he was just like fucking flailing and he does a take and he's like, is that even close to what you want? Like, what the fuck are we doing here? But I'm telling you, they, they do and it. Michael and Bay's also, like, I don't know. I don't even have a fucking short list. <laughs> <laughs> and then they turned, they turned it into Dune for robots. You would like that. The sandworms were actually just robots just eating yeah. people. That was pretty They fun. shot, and I've got a little trivia here for you. Uh, and I actually saw uh, Lawrence Arabia the other night. So this is a fun little callback to uh, the Jordanian Impossible government. Mission Impossible opened with fucking Lawrence Arabia. Well, can, we get, can everybody leave Lawrence Arabia alone? It opens with fucking horses in they the did desert. John like, Wicket as well, same thing. Yes. <laughs> so the Jordanian royal family. To be fair, they were family, supposed to come out first. Sorry. The Jordanian royal. So the, apparently, this film, the Revenge of the Fall, Revenge of the Fallen. Yeah. Is that yeah? Yes. Uh, yes. The film That's shot the movie for we're talking days, about. The, the film shot for four days on location in Jordan, in the deserty area where very four? famously Lawrence of Arabia. It said only four days. It must have also shot in some other places. Like um, you think Petra, Wadi Rum, Salt. Like there's a lot of different desert settings that they were at. Yeah. But when they were in four, Jordan, four days was four days was B roll. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. sure. The Jordanian royal family who loved Transformers, the, the first one from 2007, provided assistance from the Royal Jordanian Air Force. This is a fun throwback because in Lawrence of Arabia they did the same thing and basically lent all of the big war scenes that you see. They lent a lot of their military. Uh, so they have a history of doing this. Good for you, Michael Bay, for coaxing them into coming mm. into the film industry one more time. That's pretty cool. Make that money. I wanted to point out, just as I didn't mention this, um, we have talked about a Michael Bay movie in this series, have we? Do we mention a Michael Bay? Have we talked about a Michael Bay movie so far in this bracket? He did. Uh, let me see. We haven't. Sorry, I thought we did there for a second. I just wanted to point out that I actually spent a lot of mental energy um, last spring. Mm -hmm. Was Arm 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 he did Armageddon. Yeah, Armageddon. Thank you. Um, this past I didn't, I didn't want to thinking, say I didn't want to be wrong, but yeah, it's Armageddon. No, no, no you got, you, your your instincts were right. Uh, I had I was in this class that was taught by this this brilliant man named Bruce Block who ended up kind of writing the book on like production design and worked in lots and lots and lots of movies. Shout out. Um, and he ended up using his examples a lot in his teachings and. Um, Michael Bay and I thought at first I thought this was kind of silly but it's kind of changed the way I look at his movies now and how effective he is one of those filmmakers for visual storytelling like in terms of literally design and composition of the camera how it's placed what it's doing and also what the it, production design is actually doing to affect you and I just, I just I was thinking about it the other night even watching Transformers almost every single shot was saying something and as much shit as this man likes to get for you know not getting into the 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 deep waters of the misogyny and stuff like that that may have happened later in the career he got a lot of crap I think for being you know, a blockbuster filmmaker who maybe never seemed to bring the emotional heat that some of the other really successful blockbuster filmmakers like of his time, his contemporaries brought. But aesthetically, I mean, it is always captivating. I think, I think, yeah. I think in the later Transformers movies, the plot started to kind of dissolve and it was harder to find ways to invest emotionally in what they were doing because I couldn't quite. 
I started, I stopped being able to tell the difference between the the war sagas between the machines. But early yeah. on, I, I would have I feel to like look there up was a list. something there. I'd have to look up a list on the internet to tell you what order those movies are in. I couldn't tell you oh, just yeah. from the titles. They are mm-hmm. absolutely churn them up. We have gone. We got yeah, we, 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 we got to wrap it up. We, and we know who we're voting for, so it's ridiculous. Just one more thing about Michael Bay. Come on, he 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 directed Donny Osmond music videos, including Sacred Emotion. The guy knows emotion. Yeah, in visual storytelling. I mean, come on. He's an emotional man. Give it up for Michael Bay, ladies and gentlemen. So it's the Dark Knight, um, right? I'm going to let you guys vote on this by yourself since I didn't see it, but I think we already have the answer. Dave? Yeah, I think Transformers. Yeah, get the fuck out of here, Dave. All right, <laughs> yeah, so the Dark it. Knight yeah, moves on. Beautiful. Surprising to no one. All right, we're going to take a quick little break so I can get a beer that's not I warm. I half joking. <laughs> Honestly, it's the Dark Knight by far. Um, okay, cool, guys. So let's take a quick little break, and then we are going to come back at you with Toy Story 3 against Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. This one is very interesting. I'm curious to see what you guys do this. Yeah, Let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you guys really telling me that your Max, fucking HBO Max, are you telling me your sound volume, your volume issues aren't driving you fucking insane on Max? I don't. What, I don't have so many what issues. Are we talking? I don't have so much volume I, issues, but ever since they went to Max, mine drops out of sync halfway through the fucking movie. I turn really? up. Yeah. I turn up my volume. I'm not shitting you to 100, and I have a sound bar with a subwoofer, and then the action sequences come and rattle my walls, and then I, but I can't hear the dialogue if it's not on 100. And before you try to tell me about the sports settings or anything, Dave, it's my not settings the are exa- settings. My settings are exactly the way you fucking left them. All right. <laughs> You did my settings, and every single time I watched, and I think both are these are both of these movies. What are we talking about? Oh, so when we talk about Harry Potter, I mean, I was trying to make dinner and I made a video, and all of a sudden this fucking TV was shouting at my phone. Yeah, pro, have you I ever mean, tried? Pro, pro tip on these: uh, a lot of the sound bars that take five point one don't translate from Atmos uh, Dolby Atmos to five point one very well, um, and it, it. it basically puts all like five surround speakers through the sides and just your dialogue in the center which drowns it the fuck out um so Dave, i don't know that shit that could be it you could also try that have you also it. tried sounds- you could be going changing you know as well I, apple tv i assume you're using apple tv the yeah. yeah the device have you tried and you can find this in most of the streaming options uh your audio settings within while watching something you can change it to reduce loud sounds and it basically puts a compressor on everything so you can turn it up as loud as you want for your dialogue to be as loud as you want and theoretically no sound effects will go above that volume okay good to note we're back people let's go we are talking <laughs> that is exciting. about that is dynamic <laughs> little techie chit chat bullshit let's do it but this is important because it's it was really driving me nuts it's really driving me nuts yeah um we're talking about toy story um, also 3 to- set, set your output to pcm not uh not surround i'm just gonna listen back to this tomorrow yeah um <laughs> Toy Story 3, number one movie of 2010, 3. internationally mm. and domestically, and came out in the summer. John, what else made some money in the summer of 2010? God, let me tell you. Um, Avatar was still very, 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 very cleanly uh, number two for the entire year. So, you know, that was just yeah. such a phenomenon. So blah, 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 blah. Alice in Wonderland, number three. I thought that was kind of interesting. Nice. That uh, March 5th, mm. so second, first quarter f- ish right like i think that's uh, kind of interesting it did that yeah. well over time uh iron I mean, man 2 did that well at four. all uh <clears throat> David, yeah get there get, you fucking drink your drink <laughs> iron man drink 2 number four once again i still think that's interesting that it came out around the same time as the first one the previous movie uh this one came out on may 7th the other what, one came out in may came out? Blah, blah, blah. iron man 2 okay yeah yeah number seven right? world, so number, yeah, number seven world still, so good they are still putting in their they're digging in they're trying to get into this zeitgeist they're even though number two isn't so good they're still proving themselves to be something to watch but yeah they're not dominating quite yet so iron man 2 was number four number five the third twilight saga jesus that's one two three folks for anybody yeah. who's counting um eclipse i never saw know. any of these i think i saw the second one uh, the second so i don't one's know the, anything the about second these one, movies I'm, I'm on record for saying the second one is the worst movie i've ever seen in my life i've heard a lot of people tell me that so maybe that was a bad first impression because it's the <laughs> that was what the wow that, 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 that was nuts god twilight the twilight gods 
I'm yeah. mad at you. For Vampire's a piss, shit. man. <laughs> <laughs> I got a hex on Here we me go. Now. I better not Number be in Portland six. anytime soon. Number six, two years later, Mr. Nolan gives us Inception. So that's fun. Uh, I don't know if any of us give enough credit to this person who, yes, he made the superhero movies. We just talked about one, but he also makes other movies that have nothing to do with superheroes, and he still ends up being in top tens whenever he makes them. Congratulations, Inception. Anybody who loves that movie, go for it. Uh, Number seven, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one. So we will be discussing that part two in the next episode. Number three worldwide. Yeah, pretty great. Number eight, Despicable Me. Number nine, Shrek Forever After. Never saw it, you guys. Sorry, I know we talked about number one, number two. I guess this is number three. You did this not is number miss three? much. Yep. All right, you heard it yeah, straight from Dave's mouth. Hey, number before. 10. <sighs> number 10, uh, Breakout. I think another DreamWorks movie. Tell me if I'm wrong, but How to Train Your Dragon. This ended up being yeah. a really, really successful yep. uh, franchise for anim- 3D animation. All right, They did Jeff. a fun little uh, Game of Thrones time with Jon Snow as well. Nice. The movies, they yeah later, yeah they reference him. He's in. He appears with toothless in a in a video. Oh, cool! With the dragon, wow. yeah. Did oh, not it? in the movie, like a promotional thing. No, like in a, a promotional thing. thing. Yeah, the dra- oh, okay. the dragon is like <laughs> chewing. <laughs> it's chewing fucking wow. lighting cables. It won't behave, and he's just like, "What the fuck uh, is this thing?" It's good. Fucking yeah. to- everybody say, loves toothless. <laughs> did you did you say Despicable Me? Was that one that you said? Yeah, yeah. Number I mean, eight. That, I think that movie made all of our kids Despicable dumber. Despicable Me. Um, so we have um, in our top ten. We have five animated movies. Pretty crazy. Our top two worldwide, Toy Story 3 and Alice in Wonderland, both made a billion dollars, and they're both Disney, which reminds me to tell you all, fuck Bob Iger at the moment. There you go. Oh, wow. What? Wow. So what? What? We know we can't work anymore because of him. So there you go. But we, I mean, not me. I'm not tag. That and fuck Bob have... Iger is inherently negative, even if you how should. Many, how many mm. podcasts... I've said that. For better or for worse, how many podcasts have had that phrase uttered since like <laughs> yeah, two right. days ago? Oh man, Bob. Um, um, yeah. So very interesting. Um, they always say like the Oscar movies are the indie movies that nobody sees, but The King's Speech, which would go on to win mm. Best mm. Leading Actor, Best Director, and Best Picture, and Best Screenplay, made four hundred million dollars worldwide. And the that's social network made a lot of great. money too. So that's really good for your, you really know, usually, good for, yeah. Yeah. Because that's the stigma is that that doesn't happen. But this is the year of the King speech versus the social network, of course. Mm. So I already talked about those awards. Jeffrey Rush in the King speech lost to Christian Bale for the fighter. The fighter. I feel like that is where the David O. Russell movies are like, oh, so everybody in these movies is just going to be nominated for Oscars. Because you also had Melissa Leo who won. So you have two winners in this category. Mark Wahlberg was not nominated, but he certainly made a fuck ton of money being the lead of that movie. Um, and Helena Bonham Amy Carter Adams actually- was not nominated? Yeah, I guess not. I don't think- uh, I don't think she was. No, I don't sorry. think so, Keep but going. I can't remember. Um, Helena Bonham Carter won the BAFTA for the King's Speech, but lost the Oscar to Melissa Leo. And then Natalie Portman does basically a clean sweep, except Annette Benning won one or two awards for The Kids Are All Right. Mm. David Sorkin wins Best Screenplay for uh, Social Network. David Seidler won for King's Speech, as I mentioned before. You said David Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> Dude. Dude. You know, I'm call- you, you don't need Christopher fucking Facebook. Nolan. I'm calling you out for that one. Christopher <laughs> Nolan won the WGA award, though, over both of them. Or actually, for Inception. I, that was a original. Inception. So he he won over yeah. um over King Speech. Sorkin won for the, um, uh, Adapted. Randy Newman wins an Oscar for We Belong wow. Together from Toy Story 3, which won Best Animated Feature Film, of course. Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor very famously won Best Score for the show, Social Network. Their first, they would go on to win for Soul. And they famously won because their score was very ambient. And a lot of the background noise that would have been for sound designers actually came from the score. And there's a lot of talk and crossover that Dave probably knows a lot more about than me. And Inside Job wins Best Documentary. Other Oscar movies, True Grit, Jeff Daniels and Haley Seinfeld are nominated. Winter's Bone, Jennifer Lawrence nominated as a child. Blue Valentine, Michelle Williams nominated. Ryan Gosling was not. Rabbit Hole, Nicole Williams, Nicole Kidman was nominated. James Franco was nominated for 127 hours before he smokes a ton of weed and is never nominated again. And Javier Bardem is nominated for Beautiful. Jeremy That's Renner gets two things that get kicked out of the Oscars. <laughs> Dave, your favorite movie came out this year. Scott Pilgrim yeah. versus the World came out yeah. this year. Book of Eli, Jackie Chan's The Spy Next Door. I kind of don't feel like reading anymore, but I like to yeah, say Fish good. Tank came out this year. 
which would never be made anymore ever, which you probably shouldn't. Christopher Columbus did Percy Jackson. We're, we're talking Harry Potter movies. Where is Logan Lerman? I feel like that comes up every now and then on our show. I'll shut a couple out. Shutter Island. Shutter Island was famously bumped to February. People thought it was going to be an Oscar movie and they kicked it. And I'll just give uh, MacGruber. That's the other one. I'll, there's a lot of other shit, but we got to move on. John? MacGruber. What else do you want to shout out? Before Dave kills us. Uh, nothing, <laughs> I guess nothing crazy. Of no, I did want to mention Easy A just because that was kind of our uh, the beginning of Emma Stone like coming into yeah. the world, and then she really kind of started yeah. taking over and mm. being a very big heavy hitter. The MacGruber um, movie. The MacGruber movie. Uh, the Book of Eli. Death at a Funeral helped get Dinklage. Um, Game of Thrones. Book of Eli. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. 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 Um, the Robin Hood, and there was something else. Doesn't matter. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Toy Story three. Toy Story 3, you guys love this movie. Talk to me. What do you guys think? Did you, Dave? Did you guys rewatch it? I watched it very sleepily last night. I'm not going to lie. I got home very, very late, but I still I still powered through and it was enjoyable. Dave, what would you think? Um, I, I rewatched this because I hadn't, when we did the franchise one, I hadn't seen it. Um, and so this oh, was yeah. the second time I'd watched it. And yeah. I don't know, dude, I feel like they peaked in two. Ah! I, feel, I feel like they peaked yeah. in number two. Yeah. But we well, and we had a whole conversation, didn't we, about like which one was best? Because everybody, there were a lot of people. I think there's a whole camp of people who thought that this one, with all of its lovely nostalgia, especially in that beginning section mm. with the vid- home video where it kind of shows the dog getting older. Obviously, Andy and his sister getting older. Um, and I yeah, can't remember. I mean, does anybody remember where we landed? Did we decide in the franchise face off which one we thought was the best one? Dave, we, did you we, say two then? Uh, we included, I think, four at that point, didn't we? As well. Yeah, because that had to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Trash. Trash. <laughs> Forky. <laughs> I love Forky. I love Forky. Just in case. Best part of four. Um, we'll go through, let's go through our list again at the end of this little segment. I want to go through our list again. At the um, end of the segment. Yeah, I, uh, Dave. To, to be honest, I, think I, I agree I, with you. Dude. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you what this was about in between watching. I was not I, invested at all. I agree with you. I agree with you. Get and it was the such fuck a... out of here. This is so fun because so many kids get so hung up on the college thing, and you know how I feel about this. So this is easy for me. I'm having a fucking blast right <laughs> Please now. Please <laughs> go back into it. <laughs> no. Anyone who was not uh-huh. listening to our podcast when Jeff was talking no. about no the notes, it's, it's one. It's one of the yeah quotes of the show ever. So. I want I want you to just go they take like just a pour note. a bottle of whiskey. They wrote a note to Andy. <laughs> Jeff they Stone. wrote a note Stone. and Andy just said, "Hey mom, maybe I should donate these toys." And it's like, "No, it's not fucking Chucky, oh, people." Oh god. <laughs> the fucking I, the, the weird. reason I love the reason I love fucking your like Charlie Brown and shit is cuz we don't see the adults. In this movie, they have all of the toys and the the the, the grown up they interact so much and it's like it's so weird every single time they do it. That's way better of a movie when we don't see the kids or we don't see the adults with the exception of when they're getting fucked up at that one like camp thing or whatever or whatever that daycare center is. When they're getting fucked up and then it's like, "Oh my god, they're terrible." Yes, that makes sense. But at the end when they're all just sitting there and the girls playing with her and I was like, "Is this a chorus line where we just went through this whole thing and then they're all just fucking toys at the end?" So like you know it's god i'm gonna agree with you i i I agree with that and basically i was trying to think of how to phrase this because i am dave i felt very similar to you i still enjoyed watching it there are some amazing standout emotional moments in this film and sequences that are breathtaking very specifically though it's when there is nothing to do with the humans like whenever I thought about the humans and the context of Andy and his family and stuff, there I'll bitch about them in a second. It's just made it weirded me out and confused me, and did, I just don't know if it works dramatically. Yep. The stuff with the toys on their own, I think it was fine. There's a part of me that wonders if they tossed around in their in their incredible their their brain trust meetings or whatever, where they talk to each other about all their movies. I wondered if this would have been a stronger film if he if they were already in the attic. And they were going to be tossed out. And then Andy had to determine, do I throw these things away or do I save them for maybe the future? Because this watching and then specifically. They, then they all had to fight gladiator style to see who stayed in the box. Something, dude. That would yeah, be fun if it like opened that. and they do that whole sequence and it turns out nobody was playing with them. They were just playing with themselves yes. in the attic. That's I, cool. Y'all, this yeah, time, this time I could... I could interest. not get past you guys. <laughs> I could not get past the fact Dave, that... playing like, with himself in the attic. <laughs> Come on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. 
Did you guys keep your fucking toys in the trunk next to your bed when you were trying to fucking feel up girls in high school? I'm, I'm sorry, but I just got to say it. Did you bring girls back to your bedroom with your fucking stars mm. wallpaper? Your yeah, kids your beanie babies, baby. You, get those, you got scoop right next to your pillow. Let's go. Yeah. Look, I'm fucking sorry. I know the that's girls fucking can do it for sure. like, the Ladies can do it. I, I thought I girl, ba- maybe, maybe. I mean, we can't speak to that, I guess. But like, give me a fucking break. There were so many elements of this one. That this is watch such specifically. A red flag. <laughs> it bothered me so much. I was like, this is fucking college. bullshit, dude. Are we going to talk about his stunted development? They're going to bring Because if Andy he still has fucking... That they're was Woody, so to Woody to college. weird. That was so weird, dude. They didn't address it Guys, at all. And in a normal world, that would be a huge red flag on his maturity. Literally they, a, week just a, ago, given here. a week ago, you reckoned back to the, the franchise face-off. You're like, it's going to be emotional next week. It's going to be an emotion. And everybody talked about how emotional this is, you know, saying goodbye to your toys and stuff. And here you are, as if you didn't say this a week ago. I feel like you are two-faced. No, no, you're Aaron Sorkin. What did I say? You're Aaron Eckhart. God damn it. You're Aaron Sorkin. What did I say? With the toys, <laughs> with the toy moments... The toy moments got me, you guys. When they all held hands and they're about to be destroyed, sure, that's a go-to. The yeah. ending still got me when Woody sits up and he watches Andy drive away, even though that whole sequence is strange getting into it. The note is strange getting into it. But once he's giving her the toys the and once did. she's yeah, sleeping the with did. them yeah. and yeah. when he drives away, I still, my, the hair stood up on my arms. They, they got me with the emotional standouts. Same. It's just Same. the way that they had to get there, the justification to get there. I agree with Dave. I was still willing to buy into the world of those toys being a part of Andy's life and them needing to get back to him in two. At three, I just don't know if their overall theme, and of course, who the fuck am I? It's fucking Pixar. They're brilliant. Yeah. I'm an idiot. But I just don't know if the I mean, overall theme, which I think film, was we that, can bag it all we want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> I think the number one movie. theme that they were trying to get through, and tell me if you guys disagree, was that it's not about him... It's not about him playing with us. It's about just being there for him in any capacity. So even if he, if, even if for that, even if that means just being in his attic or just being a collectible from his past, and I just don't know if that was the tip of the spear, the way it probably should have been thematically, because it felt like they were still very much in his, in his world just by being in the trunk, and mm. I, I don't know. So I agree with you guys. I also, I also just wanted to point out. I think they broke a couple of rules that they set up, which Pixar is usually Ooh, rock solid about not okay. doing. Oh, why does why does? And I think we bitched about this a little bit. Ready, ready. Hold on, because I remember being I was really drunk. I think when we talked about this yeah. on the franchise face off. But do you guys understand the logic of why Buzz goes back to being Buzz who remembers everything? No, there's why no was lo- he no. able to go back? He just to, got rocked. You know what he I mean? hit his head really they, hard. Yeah, well, they they wipe him though, right? They go mm. back to demo mode. And then they switch him to Spanish speaking mode. And then somehow he comes really back fun, to being way, Buzz fun. Lightyear. Like, that's a little convenient. And I thought that was a little disappointing that they didn't, you know, when they wipe 3CPO at the end of whatever, uh, Rise of Skywalker. Mm. That was a bold choice, right? Fucking yeah. wipe out like our, our big. So I don't know. There's Dude, just a few gets, things he gets like that. He's wiped so many times. Aw. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to sound like I'm shitting on it too hard, but I think my hopes. We're really high. I was like, God, I'm about to be fucking emotionally rocked. Like I was with Nemo. I was ready Mm. to come on this podcast and be like, they made another perfect movie. And I I don't think this one holds up quite as much for me as I was, uh, as I was hoping it would. Maybe it's just a rewatch thing. I'm going to be honest. There was never one second that I thought this was going to be as emotional for me as finding Nemo. (laughs) Is it because of the note? Can you just not, is it the note? Were you just thinking about the note as soon as you pressed play? You were like, fucking, eventually this builds to Woody writing a fucking sticky note. I I want to praise him. I want to praise him. I cannot believe they got more than one movie out of the fact that the toys are real. I, I can't fuck. I can't fucking believe it. And the second movie, it's it's simple because second it's one's kind, so good. It's kind of a heisty thing because they get replaced yeah. and they want to, you know, it's that's like cool. And then in this movie, it's kind of like that, kind of, but it's like, guys, the, they're they're toys, you know. And I, I just like Woody versus Buzz in the first movie and the lines drawn in the sand of who's on whose side. Like that's exciting. That's cool. Hmm. It was the first one of these. Four is kind of fun because they go to this weird wonderland kind of dystopian circus kind of thing. So I like, and then Key and Peel are so funny. How did they get more than one movie out of these fucking toys being real when people aren't around, but then having to pretend to be dead? You know, they're fucking clever. 
Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm say brilliant. And they got one of the best <laughs> casting decisions of all time is Wallace Shawn as T-Rex. Like, so the casting decisions are brilliant. You got Don Ruckles and Estelle, Par- Estelle um, Harris. That, Jeff, Jeff did you rewatch it? Yeah. That moment when they all get to Sunnyside and they're all first interacting with the toys and they're having a great moment. And it looks at Wallace Shawn and he's surrounded by the other dinosaurs and he's just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, he's just, just laughing. laughing. He's so happy. Yes. <laughs> so fucking good. And Ken and Barbie's but God, funny, Jeff, but yeah. Oh, oh for Jeff, sure. I've been looking forward to this conversation. So Your frustration with the premise of these movies brings me so much joy. I think about it all the time, how upset you are with the, you would have been fired from Pixar from day one. Yeah, you would, this is like the first unless, idea they had. Unless I was the I was the one they kept. I was like, we'll have one dissenting voice, and I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I'm like, are you sure my job's secure? Are you sure? Are you sure, guys? I need it in writing that my job's oh my secure. God. I'm the one dissenting voice here. This does have here. legs. I can hear you in there. What are we What are we gonna do after the first one? No, because <laughs> I like love four. the idea of the first one that they that the, the toys matter more than just be. They, they really can come to life in a child's imagination, and then mm. they start having to expand on that, and that's really difficult. It's so hard, and the, the toys can want to fuck each other so much before you realize none of this matters. They're toys, but all the toys start partnering up. Yeah, this is and there's some fun classic like how are they going to do new toy moments? The reveal of Ken, you know, there's some fun, really great throwbacks to all these other these Mattel properties and we all know them and it's fun watching them relate. Um, This plot also, Dave, did you feel this way? Because I don't think I have watched this in a while. I kept getting this confused with two. Because it felt in a way the idea of the prospector and now lots of lots of. Um, they felt very, very similar. And I know Pixar has a, the Pixar formula and has been yeah. broken down a million times by people analyzing how they create their arcs again and again successfully in their, in their sequels. But this one for me, just I just don't know if it really stuck the landing. And I'm not quite sure if it's because of the plot or if it's because of what I was talking about that I just personally couldn't get past the world of toys still being in this Let's face mm-hmm. it, if this guy hasn't like messed around and done some drugs and maybe hooked up with a girl and broken some rules, and it, I, am Jeez. I supposed to believe that he's done those things in that room? I just can't do it. And also, am I a shitty person for thinking that? Like, I was also like, am I growing up? Did I grow up too fast? Like, I didn't know anybody who behaved the way Andy did in his fucking little kid's room with his fucking... There weren't any posters of hot girls or hot guys or... It was all just like it was still nine years old in the production mm. design of the room. It was kind of strange to me. Yeah. Don't you love Ernest? Ernest is in this. Like, that's cool. Okay, guys, we got to get into... I think he had passed by this point, right? Wasn't it somebody else doing the voice of the dog? Or was he still alive? I don't know. Hmm. He still gets credit. Deathly Hollows! Deathly Hollows, <laughs> part two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about this with you. 2011, let's do it. Let's get into it. Our final movie we're talking about, Deathly Hallows Part 2. John, what made money in 2011? Oh, my goodness. What made money in 2011? Let me just tell you about it. We have another <laughs> Michael Bay property coming in with the, just a domestic for the for the year, folks. So, of course, these things are different. Number two, though, domestic for the year, Transformers, Dark Side of the Moon. That is number three, and I don't think I saw that one either. I, I may have. I may have. Do you guys <laughs> remember you. that one? Okay, no, uh, no. Twilight. <laughs> but again, <laughs> I've, Twilight seen, saga. I've seen all the backpacks. They look great. God almighty, you guys, we are just drowning in franchise at this point. The 2000s are just, God, we just yeah. can't create original They're IP. Really look late at this. The number one, <laughs> number one, Deadly Hollows Part 2, number two, Transfer Dark Side of the Moon, number three, Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn. So we're now we're into like a, a reboot of the reboot of the sequels or whatever. Um, no, Break, Breaking Dawn is the final book the f- and they split it into two movies. Yeah. Fourth one into two movies. Yeah. Harry Potter did that with the stars, seventh book. And right? they all signed three movie deals. And so when they split that movie up, they all made so much money. Good and and good for them, and I'm glad people saw them. I didn't Dude, see any of these I, movies. The, but... only, the only good thing about those last movies was Evil Dakota Fanning. Evil Dakota Fanning, yeah, for yeah. sure. Good for her. Cool. Best child. Another all time. franchise, uh, Hangover Part Two, number four for the year, or for you know domestically. Number five, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, I can't see the full title. It starts with an O. <laughs> it's 
Does anyone have on it? Stranger Tides? On Stranger, on Stranger Tides. Tides. Excuse me. Don't say it like you fucking memorized all the titles of. of no, it's, I'm Caribbean. just I'm just having memories where I'm like, oh, how are they going to do this without the full without the cast? Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> Penelope Cruz got Ready? a lot of money doing that. Yeah. Number six, the best of this franchise, but still the fifth fucking movie in a franchise. Fast Five coming in at number Hell six yeah. for the year fast and furious number five uh seven cars two guys i'm literally these are all yeah. franchises i haven't gotten to an original one yet cars two is number seven number eight thor which i know is the original thor but still it's in the marvel world so i'm still going to call that part of a franchise <laughs> number nine rise of the planet of the apes i'm still going to call it part of a franchise mm-hmm. even though it's the beginning of this new reboot and number 10 captain america first first Tell me out, Dave. First Avenger. Did Jeff knows his pirates? You know the yeah. First Avenger. <laughs> so one through fucking ten, and I'm not complaining. Like these are all great. These are a lot of these are really really good franchise films. But god damn it, we are safely in franchise territory yeah, now. Franchise Nobody fucking now. came close to making original material and getting anywhere near these movies. Hundreds of millions of dollars away from their success. Um, they are fun though. Jeff, hit me. Guys, seriously, I'm like blacking out listening to you saying these things. I'm, you're literally shouting these franchise movies, and my brain just tur- turns another switch off as you keep saying. <laughs> just to remind fuckers. everybody too, I pitched this idea for us to do this fucking thing so we can stop talking. We about literally super went movies. from like Guardians <laughs> no. Two and Shazam Two or Guardians Three and Shazam Two, this and we're like, guys, fault. we're done with this. <laughs> and we've done we've done like f- four Star Wars, four Batman's. We've done like. I mean, uh, we are doing really do Transformers. Fuck us. Maybe we should do like the Is least Potter, foreign, there... foreign film of the year. Is oh that our next... <laughs> Tune in for. I feel like oh they're just going to be like French porn. This is oh, I wish it was French porn. That could actually be um, a really invigorating. So shut up, shut up. Don't. Say... All right, all right, all right. Don't say... John and I are like, you don't tease us with French porn, Dave. Okay. <laughs> 2011. Um, we had multiple billion dollar movies worldwide. Harry Potter, Transformers, Empire, Stranger Tides all made a billion dollars. So we're just fucking flying here. The top like 14 movies all made a half a billion dollars worldwide. And yes, Puss in Boots was the first of its series. The Smurfs was sort of the first, but they were IP in a way and yeah no original movies are anywhere near this fucking thing i wrote thank god we don't have two transformer movies this week thank you harry potter for out earning the highest grossing transformers movie (laughs) that's my takeaway from this year um the uh, oscars you might remember this as the year you don't remember it because the artist won a lot of yeah that's right the movie the artist Mm. you remember that movie i do remember it michelle has which i think was a pretty fun movie berenice bear 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 Fantastic actress, did not win Best Supporting Actress, was denominated. Jean Dujardin won Best Actor. George Clooney almost won for The Descendants, and he said, I believe someone speaking French is going to be accepting that award, and he was right. Meryl Streep won her third Oscar for Iron Lady, um, beating Viola Davis, who was really in contention for that award to become the second African-American winner of that award, but it did not happen this year because Meryl Streep won for The Iron Lady. Really cheesy movie that she won. What movie was Viola nominated for the help which also featured octavia spencer who Ooh. won which Best is now very controversial actress. looking back sure white director yeah it makes total sense and you also have jessica chastain breaking out with the help we know who she oh, is yeah. largely because of this movie she was so 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 good in this movie christopher Plummer wins for beginners becoming the oldest ever winner in this uh and and of an acting Oscar God, that's for a good sure. Movie. And I think Ewan McGregor and Melanie Laurent are fantastic with Christopher Plummer, of course. The way they play out all of the scenarios, if you know this movie, it's really, really great. I think it's I saw it in theaters and I was very touched. I watched it again within a week. It was so good. It's a good one, man. Other Oscar movies, my week with Marilyn. You had nominations for Michelle Williams and of course Kenny Branagh playing Laurence Olivier. You have The Descendants with George Clooney, as I said. Um, also, Shailene Woodley really broke out in this year. Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy gives Gary Oldman a nomination, and you can't forget Moneyball, guys. People, Moneyball is a really good movie. It's a sports movie, Moneyball, yes. Yeah, man. Brad Pitt so and Jonah good. Hill were both nominated, as was Aaron Sorkin, but fantastic movie. David um, Sorkin. Also, don't forget about Bridesmaids, nominated for Best Screenplay. Yeah, dude, I was like, yeah, get there. And Melissa McCarthy is nominated for Best Actress in a Supporting Role for fucking Bridesmaids, probably just from when she took those 10 dogs out of the fucking bridal shower (laughs) and she took those dogs off. God, she's so good. I also really love Albert Knobs. That's when she puts her leg up. In the airplane, yeah. she put, for her real life husband, for the air marshal, for the her real life husband who ended up directing her. And in a when lot she of movies. shits in the sink, 
Oh yeah. Max von Sydow is one of the oldest nominees ever too for Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. And oh, I actually shit. rewatched. Don't let me forget. I watched Midnight in Paris last week, and I forgot to mention it. Midnight in Paris wins Ooh. Best Screenplay, and Woody Allen did not accept it. Not because of all the controversies. It's because he never goes to the ceremony. Um, Rain. Who Rango. Rango wins Best <laughs> Animated Film. A Separation wins Best Foreign Language Film from Iran, which was crazy at the time because Iranian films never made, they never broke big like that, but that was awesome. And mm. Man or Muppet won Best Song from the fucking Muppet movie, and then Hugo won like all the technical awards. Mm. Um, I really don't feel like mentioning any of these movies other than War Horse came yeah, out this year. We're, sure. we're out. Like we gotta, we gotta move on. Yeah, sure. No <laughs> strings attached. And Day Friends with Benefits done. came out this year. The Let's fuck but not date. Except we will by the end of the movie. Kind of movies came out this year. Green mm-hmm. Hornet, Dave, you gotta love that. <laughs> that Justin Bieber, Never Say time. Never, directed by John Chu. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Limitless became a series, and that was um, did we talk Bradley about Cooper's Green first Lantern, Dave? We did, didn't we? Oh, I wait, said was it Green, Green, Hornet, Hornet, Green Hornet, Green Hornet, Green Hornet. Yeah, Green, Green Hornet. Hornet was the one where I had ins- really chronic insomnia, and I put it That's on, right. and I lasted about half an hour. I was wait, out. which one's which? Ryan Reynolds or Green Je- Seth Ryan Rogen. Reynolds? Green Hornet, Green Hornet is Seth Rogen. <laughs> Seth Rogen. <laughs> Whoops. Insidious came out this week. So hashtag Mark and Mark, Matt and Mark. They talked about Insidious this week. Sucker Punch, Lincoln Lawyer. Guys, we got to mention Super 8 came out this year. You've just been rattling I'm off movie names movie for about 10 Ryan fucking Reynolds minutes. and Seth Rogen called Contagion. The Green Horn Turn. What do you guys think? <laughs> I feel like that's available and ready to rock. Anonymous, Cowboys and Aliens. The Big Jagger, Shame whatever man and you know what i can't believe it guys i can't believe it they they bought a zoo they really bought a zoo they really did it yeah i didn't watch All right, it shut the fuck up who rewatched the Adels part two i did i watched it i rewatched it good for you dave what do you think I just, we got two seconds yeah, to talk about it um oh, and i saw margin call uh, too recently that came out this year dave what, eyes of march i mean dave 50 50 go ahead deathly hellos part two for me that was the culmination of like now, granted, and I saw someone in their comedy routine I saw referred to this as basically Star Wars with shitty lightsabers is what she made when she wrote the Harry Potter story. Oh, um, come on. And no, this is good. This is they good. Took it's this, the same storyline. Yeah, yeah, they took the this and turned it into a like as big a blockbuster because by the time they got to the sec- like this part two of this, people were going to the theatre all in costume and like dressed up to the nines and like, they all headed weekend. the houses and... You know, see it opening weekend because I saw it Thursday night. I, I saw, yeah, I, I, saw it, I saw it opening weekend. Mm. John, did you see this opening weekend? You guys, I'm going to be honest. I wasn't a big Harry Potter fan. So yeah, I don't even think I had seen all the movies, but my sister was huge. So I went with her because she was so excited. I went with her huge. in New York to see it. Sister was huge. Sorry, Jesus Christ. She was huge. Mm. Into them. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> she was not huge. So I think we went... Friday. I don't think it was opening night, but she went that opening weekend for no, sure. Cool. I went with yeah. her and we saw a bunch of people in Brooklyn. Yeah. Sorry, Dave, back to you. I saw that Thursday night at midnight just to let you know that I uh, I win this contest. Okay, Dave, back to you. You do. You win. You win. Yeah, I mean, it was... I, I kind of liked it. Like, they developed the characters to a point where, like, when the Horcruxes started to really fuck with things. Like, the start of this movie is... A, the whole beginning of this movie is almost a real downer. Like, yeah, I love and it. it. The and first it, part is a whole real downer. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to watch part one for fun? Why are those kids at school? <laughs> yes. Those kids Those kids are fighting. Those kids are fighting to the death to protect their school while their parents yeah. stay home. What is this, fucking Florida? No, it's COVID. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> so Voldemort good. is COVID. How do they go back to school? It doesn't. There's no sunshine for two years. Well, that's just England. <laughs> it, it was England the first six movies too, Dave. Uh, uh, that is so funny. No, I had a great ride with this, like, because it was, they did leave mm. it on a mass- massive cliffhanger as such, and it was like, well, where the fuck are they going to go from here? And go so, just a yeah. two-hour movie, which is great. Yeah, uh, I, I, lined up, I lined up Love like it. everyone else, and I had a fucking great time with this. The rewatch or yeah. both times, every time? Uh, most times, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever not enjoyed it. Otherwise, I'd stop watching it. Well, you had to watch it for the, the episode. I just put yeah. it on. I just put it on um, a couple hours before we started watching this. And I'm not gonna lie. I was again. I was. I had a really weird schedule, so I was kind of going in and out of it because I was talking with other people and stuff. But I was shocked again. I've seen these so many times, and I was still shocked at how impressed I was with how they managed like 
the pacing mm. of this last half of the book. And and also just how shamelessly, but also they pulled it off, cinematic it is. Yeah. I mean, this is a very, very, very character-driven piece. And guys, correct me if I'm wrong, because again, we were drinking a lot, but this was our number two, right? For the franchise face-off? Mm -hmm. Didn't it come down to Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings? Yeah, Marvel was three, and then Mission Impossible, yeah. and then Star Wars was our order. Yeah, so this was a close one. And you know, we've celebrated and talked about just how brilliant the story is. Uh, Would it still and, be number two for you? It, it doesn't matter. Sorry, keep going. And we didn't do our toys. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure. Whatever. But I was just so impressed with, and I was I was talking with some people the other day, some fucking, you know, some film school people, and people were kind of shitting on these last three or four movies. And I was like, I love David Yates's Harry yeah. Potter world. I think he I think he sunk in so effectively and so appropriately to the stakes and represented them and expressed them in such a real way. The the opening. Again, I was that my little rant about how difficult it is to do expo exposition. Whether you like it or not, even when you're dealing with a very familiar book to movie franchise adaptation, you still have to have exposition in your movies. The way he establishes those shots, th that master shot of the Dementors floating outside Hogwarts, mm -hmm. we know where we are. Oh, and yeah. Snape and then too. that cut uh. to that shot behind Snape uh. looking out the tower window, just like. It says everything about where the world is. And I know they left us on a cliffhanger, so we, we know where we are. are. Yeah. Hmm. It doesn't say where the parents are, but I was just so blown away. And I basically, I'm not going to lie, I didn't get to finish it, but I basically watched it up to Harry's, quote, death. Do you, know how, it, do you and, know how it ends? Sure, sure. I think I know how it ends. I've seen it so many times, but... My goodness, the the emotion is just so grounded. The kids are doing such good work. The acting in this in these movies, all the way through, you just get to watch them grow up. And that scene between him and the goblin is good yeah. acting. That is a yeah. Yeah. two. There are two shots in that scene. Basically, there's a shot of the kids too, but it's mostly just a medium of the goblin and a medium of Harry, and the tension and the stakes. I was just they're just. So, I was so um, impressed. Strip hook, yeah. Mm. I was so impressed. I'm always so impressed when I watch these. And some people might have some if, ands, or buts about how they resolve it differently, a little bit differently. The set is a little bit different. I like the way they, the changes they made to it just being Voldemort and Harry at the very end with their mm. big face off. I like the way they covered all the battles. It really works for me. I feel every moment when Maggie Smith steps out and defends the school, yep. uh, as, as silly as <laughs> it is what Jeff was saying, I like that school. all the kids, yeah, I, I it love becomes her. more than I've the always, school. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. So this whole thing, you bitch. I don't know. I, this whole thing really yeah. works for me. I think it's, I think it's great. Every and to use the Jeffo quote, I think every person in this movie is having a fucking blast. Yeah. I think everybody is enjoying. This is a culmination. Um, right before I walked in here, like I said, I finished that scene and I, I teared up when the ghosts appeared and when he was talking to them about, you know, is it going to hurt? I'm ready yeah. to die. Like, got me, dude. It gets me every time. It's so mm. good. You know, those kids that growing up, they just, they're kind of, they're really nerdy and they're really scared and shy and they don't No, nobody's ever looks at them. And then they grow up. To Are you like, talking about Andy from on, Toy Story on, hold, 3? No. <laughs> <laughs> and then they grow up and they uh, the, in high school, they just start to get slowly more attractive and smart. And then they realize people start looking at them, but they can't take it seriously. And then all of a sudden they realize like, oh my God, look where I am. Like, I want to see Neville in college. I want to see Neville in college after this. He's probably such a good, he's a good boyfriend, man. He's probably like, he does well in college. Um, he turned into like a sex icon, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, did. They, Weird, right? Well, they, they did the, what do they look like now thing. And Neville was like, it doesn't fucking matter that heaven's page. dead. Yeah. Oh yeah. Actually, you know what aged really well in this movie is that final scene because it's fucking awkward. It's weird in the book, and then it's weird, in, and you know, J.K. was like, "I'm not doing any sequels, people. I'm fucking putting this, 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 this is my way of saying no sequel. No, I'm done. Mm. I'm done. In a world of IP <laughs> and franchises, I'm done. This is what happens. Yeah. And then, of course, you wrote a play. And but Warner, Warner so Brothers, cool. that's okay. We'll just reboot it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, no. But, um, <laughs> but you know what's funny is <laughs> yeah, yeah. Daniel Rack, I'm glad they didn't age them up too much because they all look good now. They almost yeah. look better now than they would, you know, and they're all like mid to late thirties, which is how they would be in this movie. Is that is that the weakest part of this movie, the end coda? It doesn't matter. It's not part of this movie. To me, it's not even part of this yeah. movie. Th me too. I guess that's the point I was gonna make. Is that it kinda it kinda doesn't matter, even though no. I do think that a lot of people thought that was kind of a weird way to end it and it's in, it it's in the book. It's in the book. What are you going to do? Not put it in the book? I know. You're not going to put it in the movie? Well, yeah. No, it's, Maybe, it's not the know. weakest thing for me because it it's an, it's an, it's a tipping the cap. 
to me. And this yeah. whole movie, if you say that's the weakest part of the movie, and then you don't acknowledge the fact that the reason this, this movie gets off on a good start is you don't need any exposition. There's no exposition. So they can have these two scenes with one with Grip Hook and one with Ollivander, and that's it. And it's like, mm. yes, those scenes matter differently because they still have to set this movie up, right? You, you're the one, John, you say all the time, they have to teach you how to watch the movie. So we've had many different, the Christopher Columbus movie is very different from the Quran movie, which is different from the Newell movie. And then the Yates, they're all different. And so right away, you see Harry's not fucking around, but he's also not taking it. He's not brooding. And so it's like, we need to do this. And I'll, I will, I will give you what you want. I'll give you this fucking sword, whatever. And and then with Ollivander, Ollivander, he was like, okay, this is it. Your business is over. Everything has changed. So this is it. It's all or nothing. And I feel like the way that this movie started is so brilliant Seeing it in the theater, there were a lot of hand, there was a lot of applause moments and a lot of that kind of stuff. That yeah. I remember, I remember being like, "I'm gonna have to rewatch this, of course," because like when Neville came out through the tunnel, which is the most obvious thing ever, especially if you read the book. But the the, re- the I mean, it was probably bigger than fucking Captain America getting the hammer. You know what I mean? Like it's probably even bigger than that. And wow, it was huge Thursday night. People were going fucking nuts for it, and we read the book. We knew it was coming. <laughs> and an hour and fifteen minutes of this two hour and five minute movie is the battle. <laughs> so it's like yeah. I, I can't believe it's so entertaining I can't believe it is so compelling and it's it's one of those earning things like I, like I don't watch Return of the King the most because it's like I need to earn that for Frodo line hmm. yeah and I've I, never I have never done this I don't know if you guys felt the same but I've never put on Deathly Hollows Part 2 right? I've always watched no. them yeah. even Deathly Hollows Part 1 I, I'm more likely to turn on knowing it was that still, it's a slow burn but yeah it was still fun to watch like it's surprisingly fun to watch it made me just want to you know press play on number one like mm. I was really shocked out of context how well it worked I started I <laughs> started was... the 20 just for fun I was cooking and I started the 20th anniversary thing which I've already seen I started it after this because it's like how did we get there I can't believe we did it I can't believe they did it emotional dude mm. fucking right. emotional so, so what do you guys think no fucking contest I, there is... I think it's no contest <laughs> yeah I agree Sorry, too Story. Story. Is part two. yeah moving forward Good stuff. Two uh, very dark Holy. films moving forward. Dark Knight and Deathly Hollows Part 2. I love it. Wow. All Fuck right. yeah. All right, well. All right. What do we, we got next? Gust, we just gussed the shit out of Harry Potter, so that's for us. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Um, We're going to get into what you've been watching here in a second, but let's set up the movies for next week. Do you guys have the numbers up? I do, dude. This is, again, I folks, I'm sorry if you feel like we're talking about movies we've talked about before. We are in that franchise world. Like, there is now there is no fucking escaping. Marvel yeah. has got its fucking stranglehold on episodes. the universe for the rest of this shit. So, number 12, for 2012, take a fucking guess at what that is. The fucking Avengers rakes it in, dude. Mm. Nobody came close to them. Avengers 12, 13, Iron Man 3. <laughs> I mean, there's just there's just no way around it. Iron Man is pretty good. Fourteen, sorry. Iron Man three is pretty good. Out of, out of all it is no. We're, all these are good. All these are good. We're just we're just here in this world, and there's no escaping it. Fourteen, Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one, which is a really excellent debut, and finally number fifteen, not a Marvel's movie, but still a fucking giant IP franchise movie, Jurassic World. So it'll be uh, Avengers versus Iron Man three. And then Guardians of the Galaxy versus Jurassic World. So we're here in Franchise City, folks. <laughs> Do you miss the 90s? Do you miss yeah, right. the 80s? <laughs> we were talking about one-offs that some fucking of, rocked us. Some of the 80s. <laughs> yeah, Wait, some you guys of re- the 80s. <laughs> Do you guys remember in uh, Deathly Hallows Part 2 when they just fucking threw the Slytherins in the dungeon and locked them up? I didn't talk about that. <laughs> I got yeah, Slytherin. I, I took the test multiple times. I got Slytherin once, and they're like it's not Me so too. bad. Me too. I know I'm a Slytherin. And they're like Slytherin. There's a lot of good people from Slytherin. I was like, oh yeah. Then why did they lock us in the dungeons when the building was on fire? We come, come a long way from Merlin, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's it. All right. What you've been watching? This is our final segment mm. where we tell you what we went up to, what we've been watching. Dave, we'd love to start with you. Why don't you tell us what we've been watching? I've, I finished the rest of Black Mirror on Netflix. Um, oh my god! I'm such a fucking kid. hell! Nice that kid. gets weird and fun. The, like one of the last ones is hilariously funny, weird. So uh, it kind of reminded That's me funny. almost of Evil in tone, but it's set in the seventies. Um, Star Trek Strange New Worlds is just going from strength to strength the la- the episode they released this week was fucking hilarious um, yeah. and we are still working our way through the X-Files we're up to season 3 damn nice dude yeah. X-Files is so good I, I think for really peaks Dave it's, you've seen it before right yeah not giving any spoilers too hardcore away but there's the end towards the end of 4 when they make their way 
mm. to a place and they see something there's i feel like there's that, that's where it kind of started changing for me and i don't know if the showrunner changed but yeah got the first four or five seasons of that are just yeah, fucking incredible. I, up to, after five they were leading up to the movie i want to believe all right um for me i had a crazy movie week and i saw everything i'm about to say i saw on the big screen um, so my Tarantino movies I saw for a class, I got to see Jackie Brown and then Pulp Fiction huh. Part 1. Fucking incredible on the big screen. I haven't seen those in a while. And then 70 millimeter screenings here at the American Cinematheque in Santa Monica for their 70 millimeter festival over the summer. This week, I saw 2001. Uh. Paul Thomas Anderson's The Master. Jesus. Uh, Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch. And then last night, we saw Lawrence of Arabia. Un- how do you still real how do you have a social life how was your uh, that we didn't do, social life felt like you. we were just going back and forth to movies this week it was a it was a heavy hitter but i'm glad we did it that was really 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 cool very enthusiastic crowds as you can imagine i had never seen the wild bunch holy crap that movie was awesome you guys yeah. should watch that if you've never seen it i had never seen it so good so cool all right jeff so my family was in was in Paris and in France last week and my significant other's a really big midnight in Paris fan and also loves Paris so we watched we did nice. a rewatch of Midnight in Paris and that was cool and they started reading yeah, Sun Also Rises that was fucking cool and Sun Also I... Rises that's my favorite Hemingway hell yeah are you dude. enjoying it yeah man it's not what I expected I don't know why I read The Old Man of the uh, Sea yeah, I read some yeah. Things, but man <laughs> and then um, I saw Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 what I would say is wait. we're ready should I should I be super pumped am I excited I'm excited it's, it's funny and I saw it with my brother and it's funny because we both he said it before I said it. He was like, it's a great popcorn flick. And I was like, you're right. That's it. And and the reviews are afterward. I didn't oh, look no, at anything the, before I saw it. It's the kind it. of movie John's going to watch part one of by mistake. <laughs> a years from now when we're reviewing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I looked at some of the reviews afterwards because I thought the same thing too, where I was like, it's a, it was really fun, really entertaining, but like nothing about it like gripped me afterwards. It's not like I was, I went to bed like thinking about it. And so I, I looked up, and a lot of things are, they're saying like the plot is paper thin. Now, you guys don't know the plot of the movie, but it's. I mean, if you wake up at 3 a.m. and Tom Cruise is gripping you, it's going to be like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck just happened? Mm, yeah. Scientology. Somebody just, out just, there is everybody. really into that, though. But, somebody um, wants anyway, that there, to happen. There, there's some AI themes and some global world domination kind of themes. But since they ditched the rest of the franchise, sort of, they brought in some elements that are useful to this, but it does feel like they're, it's a refresh. It's, it's like a restart in a way. Oh, shit, really? It yeah. feels like it to me. I mean, it's there's stuff that they've talked about before, but if you if you didn't wow. watch the previous movies, it's almost like they knew. It's almost like they were like, let's just like if people didn't come in, and I really feel like the things they're talking about are on the scale of the world. Like if if this doesn't happen, then the world will be blank. But it's also so simple that it doesn't have that spy heist thriller mystery as much because the the details like okay we need to have this exchange happen a certain way oh no this exchange is happening differently but the grand scheme of things you pretty are pretty simple and pretty obvious that it's like that doesn't change so i feel like the fact that the overall objective is so simple and straightforward the smaller details don't matter as much so therefore mm. it's like it's an, but it's an it's really entertaining it's really fun but it's not going to leave you wanting more and that's because this is part one of two, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and where they're going is going to be really fun too, but I'm not worried. Would you go out on a limb and say that like three to seven are their own world and two and one and this and part two will be different, you know, different you know what I mean? Sections I don't know if I would be. Franchise? I don't know if I would be so specific about it. I think four and I think five and six, especially the back to back, is so tense and so dark and so yeah, Sean, the Sean so Harris emotional. character is so it's so emotional. This one's not as emotional, even though we're talking about the stakes of the world. It's just not oh. as it's just not as emotional to me. Maybe you'll disagree. Mm. Maybe you'll disagree. But it's funny All because right. it has like a ninety nine percent, and the critics are like, it's amazing but the plot is thin and it's like weird that it has a 99% mm. and those are the reviews. And I think I agree. Mm. I think I agree, but it's really fun. And it's worth it. And the effects are awesome. There you go. Fun and two hours and 40 movies. minutes, went, four, two hours and 40 minutes went pretty quick. It, went, it, it did. I took a break to get beer and that's impressive. And, and AMC is really fucked up. Two that's different impressive. times. I was stuck behind people that needed the manager 
and uh, 15 minutes and it's like guys they're getting popcorn and beer like i don't know why the manager takes 10 minutes like mcdonald's would have this shit figured out in two seconds amc needs Listeners. to hire people from fast food restaurants i don't understand why it's so complicated you guys need to stop going to fucking amc times square i feel like, I feel like this place has let you down they do one not have it together 13, 14 too many times Jesus one, i mean this one there are three of them and they just ordered fucking popcorn and beer and some candy and and 10 15 minutes of them trying to talk to managers and it's like guys just give them the fucking popcorn just comp it who gives a shit get out of here yeah Thanks, guys, so much for a good conversation today. Can't wait to talk about some more IP next week in week Yay. nine of our summer blockbuster face-off. Anything else before we go? Nope. Till next time, cool things. <laughs>